can just stop. Uh, no, stop. Uh, yeah, so, okay, I'll just do an introduction. So, welcome everyone to this final PhD, PhD, HSD workshop. Um, so, yeah, today's speaker is Naibowa. Um, maybe put on your slides and I'll remember your, your exact topics. It's about collaborative learning and machine learning model markets. Uh, this will be a full day or at least most of the day. So um, in the morning, we'll probably go till 12, then break for an hour. And in the afternoon, we'll see, yeah, see how much time uh, after one o'clock. So those online, um, yeah, those online, maybe you can have your own breaks for lunch and so on. And if you're in person, then we'll be having lunch on level two. Okay, so thanks, and I think we can go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you, everyone. So, hi. Uh, today I'm going to talk about this topic is machine learning model market. So it's a relatively new topic, and uh, I will introduce them, uh, some few topics about this. And uh, let me start sharing. Uh, okay. Okay. So <clears throat> first, I need to introduce myself. My name is Wang Naibu, and I'm a third-year IDS PhD student. Supervised by Prof. N. G. Khan, and uh, I'm mainly focused on ensemble learning, federated learning, and machine learning model market. So, machine learning model market is, is what I'm doing now. And uh, the outline of this today whole schedule is uh, uh, it has contains four parts. The first is introduction of model market, second is ensemble learning, the third is ensemble selection, and the last is model search by data set. So, I will first start to introduce the basic concept. A model market, what is a model market and what, what should we do, what do we want to do with model market. And then the ensemble learning is some kind of uh, specific applications in traditional models and uh, it has something to do with this model market. And ensemble selection is a specific uh, subtopic uh, inside the ensemble learning and the model market. And the last one is model search by data set. Model search by data set is you how to Oh, <clears throat> if I switch, sorry, if we, sorry. is this okay? Uh -huh. Okay, okay, okay. So, and here, so <clears throat> the last day is model search by data set. I will introduce uh, another research topic scenario about how to search models within this model market by data set. Okay, so let's start with the first part is the introduction. Sorry, introduction of model market. So the background is the now we know the machine learning or deep learning models have been developed and applied in many scenarios, and the number of the variety of models has increased rapidly. So people keep working on how to improve the performance of these models as well as provide the custom uh, requirements. And the more and more people are paying attention to data privacy and want to protect their valuable data. It's essential for people to develop a new schema to apply machine learning models without revealing their local data. So we know as big data attracts a lot of people's attention, we recognize the big data from its four properties. We know these four properties from big data is volume, variety, velocity, and uh, veracity. So similarly, we can have a model market with also these, these attributes. So this is a background of this. And uh, we know, so this is a specific uh, attribute for big data, that uh, we can see. So, so for veracity, the data quality, data reliability for volume is, is the big data is the data grows from uh, TB to YB. And uh, the variety is the unstructured, uh, structured, uh, semi-structured data is, so the different types of data. And uh, velocity is, we need to real-time processing this big data. So this is the concept of big data. And uh, what if users don't want to reveal their local data? And can we treat these machine learning models as data to finish specific tasks? So now we know, uh, maybe many um, friends know this concept of federated learning. We know that in federated learning, the motivation of this concept is that they don't want to reveal their local data. If you have multiple parties and they have their local data, they want to collaboratively train a, a single model to improve the whole performance, but they don't want to reveal their local data. So within this scenario, what do we want to do is that we uh, upload the gradients instead of the local data to the central server. So this 
uh, figure is very simple to understand. So very easy. So this is what we mean by rate learning. So this is a machine learning technique allows uh, allows multiple parties to collaboratively train a model without data sharing. Um, but also we think that uh, inside this favorite learning scenario, uh, the gradients and the parameters will reveal some of the information too, because uh, all these parties will upload their gradients round by round. And uh, during this process, there are a lot of papers to show that this process can, these gradients can reveal some information. So what if we even don't need to the gradients and the parameters every epoch to realize the same functions as favorite learning? So this concept is what we want to do, why we want to do the machine learning model market. So the objectives of this machine learning model market is how do we design a manageable sharing platform to catalog, share fields, and serve machine learning models for the purpose of collective machine learning and machine intelligence? And how do we apply data management concepts such as FAIR uh, principles to ensure this uh, uh, findability, accessibility, interoperability, and the reusability at this model level, especially when the models could be heterogeneous black boxes. So this is the objective for uh, machine learning model market. Okay, so introduction of this, uh, you can ignore this red figure because it's uh, a little hard to understand, but uh, basically we see the model market is a model management system for collaboratively machine learning. And the model market can generate more powerful models based on existing models. So model, uh, model this, this model providers uploaded to this market. Uh, for example, we can do ensemble learning and I will introduce ensemble learning later. So unlike uh, big data systems, the model markets provide models instead of data for users. So in other words, so this end users of model market cannot access any, any data from the models providers. And the model providers have the right to make the models forget some specific data. So this data is their local data, but we know the model can contain some parameters, so contain some information that uh, can reveal some information from its local data. So this machine alignment is to let the model forget some specific local data, but uh, it, it's not only the local, it's uh, the model itself has this local data. So it's the introduction of this model market. So similarly, um, because we, we, we want to make an um, analogy to big data attributes, we can make some uh, similar attributes to mo this model market. For example, the volume is that we can have a huge number of models. So the variety is that different types of models can have different design principles, input, output functions. And uh, uh, velocity is that we can quickly generate uh, such as this ensemble models within a time slot. For example, we can get a, a, an ensemble model with one second to deal with a new combined image classification model. And uh, veracity is that all models contain data from real worlds and the worlds to apply. Uh, privacy is that data is not accessible to users and can only access the models. Uh, price or value is that we can value generated by applying these models. So we can value how much uh, the model will cost based on its performance. And uh, security is that the model should be safe enough because we want to protect the privacy of these models. And the, the, uh, we don't want some malicious users to upload or uh, to uh, to do something insecure to protect this whole model market. So this is, we can see the model market, this concept, we can make an analogy to such as App Store or data market or API market. So um, we can compare with these platforms. Okay, so to do this model market, to implement this model market, what is the challenges to do this? So the first is that we need to come with uh, some innovative ideas to efficient and manage the CRUD uh, actions, a huge number of models, such as how to build this model graph. And uh, it's very difficult to combine models without access to their original local training or validation data. As we mentioned, because our model market, their models are uploaded to us, but we don't have any access to their local data, so uh, to the data to for train these models. 
and to a specific task or scenario. How to select appropriate models for collaboratively linear is a tricky problem. For example, so uh, ensemble selection problem I will introduce later. And uh, we need to consider huge amounts of factors to value the model and give uh, the, the provide a suitable price. This is means the model price problem. So how can we evaluate how much should this model be? Uh, so if users request to forget some specific data from model, we need to produce good, good solutions to generate a new model without too much additional cost. Uh, so this is a machine learning problem I just mentioned. And uh, input output formats among models are different now because we can have some models from uh, generated by PyTorch or TensorFlow or um, Cafe or different frameworks or even you write by yourselves. So uh, with these different formats of models, how can we just uh, unify this model format so requires us to design interfaces that are compatible with these models as well as their local data? And the last one is another last one is what I want to see. The last one is how to have different clients or different users to collaboratively finish a task based on their local models or based on their local data. Um, and then for this topic, I will focus on these four problems. So the first is how can we auto analyze and compare these models? The second is how to ensemble different models. Then how to customize a specific model. So for example, we use the uh, transfer learning techniques. And the last one is how to forget the part of local data and get a new model is machine learning. But this topic I will not cover in, in this. If, I, if we have time, we can have some more details, but I don't think we have time to talk about machine learning. Uh, okay. Uh, so also I mentioned, so if you have some questions, you can just ask via Zoom and I will uh, answer them. So. Okay, so inside this model market, I will, we first need to um, define some roles for this. So we basically we have three types of roles. The first is model providers, and then the model users, the last one is technical managers. It's more like that you design a platform or when you write a platform such as a website or something to, this is three basic type of the providers. So. It's more like, uh, you know, Taobao, Amazon, or Lalada, Shopee, or this so model provider is more like the seller and the model, model user is more like the buyer and technical manager is um, more like the uh, Taobao, Shopee, the sales management. So model provider is, they provide models in a black box or white box way. And the uh, model user or model buyer, they query or buy or submit model customization requirements. And uh, then the technique, uh, technical managers, they can manage model and maintain connections or relationships between models and they implement a cost, a model customization requirements. So this is a uh, three basic roles inside the model market. And uh, for functions, so what do we want the model market it itself to have these functions? For example, we need to, we need to have the functions of model Upload, upload uh, model download, of course, is a basic function. And then we need to model evaluations, evaluate how much this uh, model should be, or the model provider can pro provide a, a value, a, a price for its own model. But we want to evaluate by ourselves that uh, do this model value this price or something. And the model ensemble is that how we can do the model combination or model fusion or model ensemble to collaboratively use different multi models to do something. And I will cover this topic later. Model alignment is I just mentioned a lot of times how to forget some part of the models, uh, local data of the models. Model product pricing is more like the model evaluation. And the uh, model customization is more like how do we use some, some techniques such as transfer learning or something to customize this model, uh, to generate a new models. It's like the library, you have many books and uh, both combine books to generate a new books or something, yeah. Okay, so the overall architecture of this model market, uh, this figure is written by my supervisor and the Prof. Brian Lowe, Prof. He Bingsheng. So from the uh, Clive ML 
project. You can see this figure at the Institute of Data Science, National University of Singapore's website to see this. So you can see uh, the motivation of this uh, model market uh, or collabor collaboratively ML project is that if we have different parties, we have different roles and uh, they belong to different uh, uh, clients. So for, us, for example, this is a, a company, uh, this is another school, uh, this is a hospital, and we have different parties, just like if you know federated learning, we have different parties. And uh, all these parties can submit or can communicate with our model market server with models. So we can they can upload, they can download uh, from these models. And this Model market will provide some uh, functions uh, I just mentioned. For example, the model fusion, model unlearning, and some more learning, and also we can use the knowledge transfer, transfer learning, model valuation, and ego uh, uh, assessment, all these uh, basic functions to do this, uh, to do the model collaboratively linear or something. And uh, underlying the data, Mm, mechanisms in model comes ML client. We can do incremental training and uh, we have the right to be forgot forgotten. So we can see from this figure. So this these professors and also the topics now is very focused on this right to be for forgotten. So now in the world, we hear our privacy very much. Uh, but unfortunately, today I will not cover this modern learning part. Okay, so let me give you some examples about how this model market can do if we have this model market. For example, scenario one is that so we can see this is a single user here. The user A, he wants to conduct some image classification tasks and uh, he searched and found 10 models at our model market. Then he can get an ensemble model with linear combination. So we can provide a Python toolkit for her, for him to use. So for, for example, you can understand this code. So this ensemble model is we can you can, you can just invoke this uh, library to so ensemble dot linear combination and the model is this model one, two, three, four, five, and this width is uh, 0 0.1 to 0 0.1, all this five ways. Uh, this is a basic figure. We can have this four basic models. For example, the one, the first model is SVM, the second model is random forest, uh, uh, random forest, the third is GBDT, the last is neural network, and then this C uh, C is uh, parameters inside this SVM. This N, for example, is how many trees in this inside this random forest, and neural network is this parameters inside this neural networks, and the ensemble method is linear combination, so it's just. Uh, uh, it has different voting method, and I will in, introduce some voting method later. And then we will provide the, the, the users an API, so we can see this selection for them to directly to um, use this linear combination in some linear part to do this. And uh, so we can see this local data is this user's local data, but this local data can will not be revealed to our model market to all to anyone else. For example, these model providers. And then after this, um, after you generated this ensemble model, we can use this same model uh, functions to save these models to another PKL file. Uh, and then uh, we can load this model some someplace else, somewhere else, and to just predict the data. Oh, for example, you can provide a SQL-like uh, uh, functions to uh, or commands to for them to use this uh, the same functions. We can use this select uh, ensemble the model where model method uh, is, the ensemble method is voting and the parameters is this parameters and, and also it's the same. So it's SQL like. Um, this is the first scenario. And uh, the second scenario is that uh, if we want to have, have this model market, the first thing is that the user wants to query and send commands to generate this ensemble models. And then uh, we want to provide uh, this uh, a GUI, so uh, graphical user interface for user to ensemble based on public data set. For example, this is a public data set and we provide this uh, Windows uh, ensemble GUI. And then uh, users can just configure some uh, parameters such as uh, last page we just mentioned, he can uh, freely to change this model, different models and different ways. 
by the school year and then uh, the system will return the uh, ensemble model for the user. So, so in this scenario, the models, the users don't, don't need to write any codes. We can just provide this user user interface for the users to generate the ensemble models. And after the models are generated, the users can download this uh, ensemble model and test on this its local data set. Okay. So this is a third scenario for model market. So user A, for example, we have the estate agent, and the user B is a bank. And we know, so they want to collaboratively evaluate these clients' property risks with own local data. And so they can share their local data description and requirements to model market. And then we can generate a customized model for them. So we should maintain a model relationship graph to discover suitable models based on the data description and requirements. Here is an in, uh, illustration about this process I want to say. So first, the user A and user B are two different parties. Uh, for example, in federated linear, we have a hospital, we have an enterprise, we have a school, and we just mentioned the two parties. One is the estate, uh, estate agent and the second is the bank. Okay, so the, uh, they will provide their local data distribution requirements to our model market. And then our model market will find a suitable model based on uh, something, for example, based on uh, relational uh, relationship graphs we generated uh, in advance. And then uh, we use this graph to select some models, uh, to find some suitable models for these two users. So they selected the models then, they will do data format adaption. And uh, uh, after they adapt their data format, we will um, provide the final customized models for these two users to use. And this, then these two users can collaboratively train something. Uh, so this is another scenario for model market. The fourth scenario for model market is that can we have user to build the easy to use transfer learning services? So can make it easy for users to retrain models with local data. So when user selected a model and wants to do transfer learning based on his local data, can we provide a simple API for user to use? For example here, user provide local data descript description and requirements. Then we provide a model with the following API. By that we can just train model this very simple. So data is local data, and epoch is five, and linearity is zero and zero point one zero zero one. Uh, so this problem is the last topic I want to mention is the model search by data set problem, and they can test by their local uh, local test of data. But you should mention you should need to know that uh, under this consideration we need the user to submit some part of the, their local data to our platform. So in to provide the privacy of this local model market, uh, of this user's local data, we need to add some techniques such as differential privacy or such as uh, homo encryption to uh, provide this local data to not to reveal to anyone. Okay, so for, uh, uh, that is to say, so we don't need to define model structures and other trivial parameters, and so we need to do out of box. Um, so this is a uh, uh, basic some scenarios I mentioned to introduce the basic concepts and uh, what we want to do and what we need to do, what we can do our model market. And then the research goal because this is my research topic. So is to the title is machine learning model market, and the goal is to implement a machine learning model market for people to take advantage of collaboratively power of machine learning models. And uh, here. Uh, not uh, machine learning model markets, but the machine learning model hubs. I can provide two examples of this uh, model hubs. So the first is Hugging Face. This is the most popular mod uh, model hubs. So we can see this page. Hugging Face has many, many models and many, many data sets now. And uh, we can see now, oh, uh, I remember four months ago we when I downloaded this model from Hugging Face, it has only 30,000 models, and now it doubled to uh, 70, 30, so it's very quick uh, incremental. And we can see from Hugging Face that uh, 
there are many models and uh, there are many different tasks you can see. But the first uh, motivation of this hugging phase is to introduce some NLP models, so such as vision transform, uh, not really transform transformers, and then because other mass, uh, models can and be added to such as vision transformer I just mentioned. And uh, this is a library they provide such as PyTorch, TensorFlow, and SJ. Um, so you can browse <coughs> some models such as this board case, the uh, board based on case. Uh, this, it's more like the uh, model versions GitHub. And uh, you can just uh, use this uh, uh, very easy tool to compute this to just uh, show this demo, okay. And uh, this Wikipedia, and you can see this is uh, one uh, one type of this model hub, but we want to add more functions uh, based on this model hub, because this model hub now, they, they can provide you to upload the models, to download the models, to test the models, but they don't provide some functions uh, such as model fusion, model ensemble, model recommendation. And if you want to search models, you can just do raw search. You can, Mm, input some keyword, but you don't want, you don't, you cannot do some specific search. For example, you want to upload some of the local data sets and uh, we provide some recommended models to you. And uh, they don't, don't provide the model recommendation, model aligning, model price, price valuation, all these kind of functions. So we want to add more based on this model hub. <clears throat> so this is the first platform I want to introduce. And then the second is a TF hub. Uh, TF hub, the, uh, TF hub is a TensorFlow hub, and it contains some models. So this model is not too much, but already many. So it has uh, about 1,000 models, if I remember correctly. Yes, it's already uh, 1,200, almost 3,800 of the uh, models here. So it contains some models such as uh, class, uh, image classification, such as NLP, and uh, such as uh, other a very uh, good training models inside. So if you want to do some uh, functions, you can uh, you can use this tool. And uh, the other model market I, I didn't, uh, not model market, the model hub is this ONX, but this ONX is more like a framework for models. So it's like uh, you have, now we have uh, different model formats, such as PyTorch, such as TensorFlow, such as, uh, cafe, but uh, different. Uh, so, if you want to just uh, combine these different model formats, it's, uh, it's more like a very hard and tricky thing to do. So, the ONX, uh, this framework is to just uh, integrate, to transfer, to convert all the existing different formats of models to this ONX formats. So you can transfer PyTorch models, uh, you can transfer TensorFlow models, you can transfer Cafe models, so any, uh, you can see uh, the supported model, or not in this page, but uh, we, we can see, so you can transfer all these different types of models to this ONX format and then uh, after you do the unification, you can uh, combine these models by your own method or something. So this is a framework for we for us to do this model fusion. And also we have other model hub. For example, we have PyTorch model hub, but it's not too much. Uh, so this is PyTorch hub, you can see. Uh, no, not very, very, very much, but you know, in research area, uh, many people are using PyTorch instead of TensorFlow, so we can see this. And also you can find many, many more uh, GitHub uh, projects to find the final models and to, to, to do this. So this is, uh, just as I mentioned, there, there are many, many different types of model hubs now, but uh, there are no model markets now. So we, what do we, uh, you remember what I mentioned that model market uh, is mod, not the same as model, uh, model hub because Model market, it has contains more functions than model hub. Model hub can only upload, show, search, basically search, and uh, to download these models. Uh, also, you can test uh, to do a demo. But uh, uh, under these basic functions, we need to add more functions, such as um, we need to do the model evaluation, model combination, model recommendation, or, all these kind of things. Uh, this kind of things is what we want to do inside the model market. Okay. 
So if I, uh, hold on a minute, I will increase the time for this slides first. Okay. Okay. So this is basically. Uh, so is there any training? Training involving trading, trading. model hub or model market. Model market. So uh, maybe you come later. I just mentioned model market. Uh, they exist. They need to model providers to upload their models to our market. So the existing models inside this model market is well trained or pre trained models. And if you want to train these models, you need to download and train by yourself. Uh, this is our motivation for now. Uh, you can do some bit. I mean, like for market basis, mm. usually we think about mm. buying and selling. Buying and sell, yeah. yeah. Mm. So, how, so, if the uh, person wants to upload a mm. model, mm. Uh, are you going to price the model? Or uh, yeah, this, this is uh, one function we provide. So, the model, model providers can upload their models for free. This is uh, one function. Also, they can provide a price. And also, we want to do we want to do some research topic to help them to evaluate how much will this model cost? How much do you cost? How much value this models will cost there on this function? So we will discuss the pricing. Pricing, I will mention a scenario is how to use this, some techniques to decide what is this price. So for example, you know, in Shopee or Lada or Amazon, when the, when the sellers want to sell some products, they need to define their price in the ones by, them, by themselves. But also, because there are many similar products inside the market, they, they need to compare different uh, products to define a suitable price. Because uh, if you define the price too high, no one will buy your products. So how to do this is another research topic. So we need, we want to help them to define, to help them to decide what price their models are. So. Yes. Independent of the data science. Uh, independent of the data science. So inside in the model market, they only provide the models. So these models are pre-trained on their local data science, but they will never upload their data science to any of the, uh, the sellers, the buyers, or uh, the model market themselves. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, whether the pricing will be independent of the data science. Uh, the pricing for the model. This, uh, this depends. Yeah, so for example, so, uh, I mean that, you know, I mean that uh, the huge data amount is very huge. And if you see you have a model that has high accuracy and uh, it is trained based on very huge amount of data. For example, you have these models and we think that this model is very valuable, right? And you can define a high pro and you can provide a high price. And, but we, we need to some to do some evaluation for the on this model. So to ensure that the information is correct, you to ensure this price is really worth it. So this kind of is, is you have we have some um, technologies to find how to do this. Okay. So are you there? Any questions? Okay, okay. So uh, let me continue. Um okay, so like, Okay, so uh, this is this demo is not working because uh, before I implemented the model market demo on the AOS SOC server, but uh, maybe some of the friends know that uh, a few days ago some attackers, so some hackers hacked in the SOC uh, clusters, and this also it affects this uh, uh, server. So now you cannot access this uh you cannot access this server now but i will provide some uh some screenshot to show how this demo works uh so this uh, so no you, you cannot just log in where this username and you, also you can register your own content system so this is basically uh, i think this details about how i implement this model market but it's not very important i just mentioned this so we have front and the back end database and machine learning models uh, based on sql and we use this mongodb docker and jigsaw this some kind of things and this is a basic software engineer architecture and uh, this is not important but after to do this so the same system functions based on this role is that uh, we can view model, we can 
uh, upload the model, we can generate the model, we can upload the model, we can enable or disable models, we can buy models, we can view, purchase the orders, we will sell orders, and we can do model example, we can check basic info, update, <laughs> update the password or charge, or we can for, for the our managers, we can do the user management. But you can see this, based on these functions, we can just compare, uh, make an analogy to some commercial websites such as Taobao or Amazon, you can see it's very similar. So different uh, roles have different functions to do. Okay, so the system itself has some functions such as logging, log out, register authentication, multi field search, search by columns, pay pagination, form validation, waiting list. Uh, but it's not very important, I just uh, uh, skip this part. So a common user can serve as a model bearer or model provider at the same time. So just like you want to, uh, buy something at uh, Shopee or Amazon, and also you you can buy models and sell models at the same time as the same user. It's okay. And uh, this is how we design the model uh, model DB MongoDB structure is not very important. Okay, so this is uh, one easy procedure to show how we do the model ensemble, and I will mention the concept of model ensemble later. Uh, so the provider, they upload their models to our model market, and then the user can buy some models on our model market. Then after the user buy some models on this model market, they can generate these orders. Uh, so the system will generate the orders, so the purchased orders to this. And after the users has buy use these purchased orders, they can add some models to this waiting list, and then, um, the waiting list is models, you can provide a GUI to for them to adjust the parameters and then we can generate an ensemble models to this model market, uh, to this end users. And then this is uh, basically GUI I just mentioned for the model market I before I designed this, but uh, you cannot access this now. But, the, but uh, what I should say, uh, uh, I can introduce this one. Uh, although you cannot accept, uh, uh, you cannot just uh, access this uh, model market directly, but uh, the code is uh, open source and uh, you can search the code by my name here. And uh, I find them with a minute. Okay, so I have some rebels and the, it's not right, it's right. So this is a model market front end and this is a model market back end. It's more like demo. So you can just deploy this model market to your own environment or to your own um, to your own computer or servers to directly to use it. So it's open source, you can use this. <laughs> uh, welcome to start. <laughs> okay, so uh, basically, after you have finished doing this, uh, implement this uh, model market, you can see this is the index page for this model market. So uh, we can see here we have three um, basic models. One is a Gaussian mixed model, the second is random forest, the third is logistic regression, and the author's name is provider, and the framework is second learn update time here and uh, they can provide some text. Then you can view these models, uh, specific information details, and you can buy these models after you log in uh, as a record up corner. And uh, here this is this model details. So the model name model also I just mentioned on this text and the, the seller will provide some price for this model. For example, this model, they provide a price of the SJD zero. So you can just buy this model freely. And uh, uh, this is a concept. This is how we upload this model. How to uh, I uh, how to upload a new model? So you can just uh, use a GUI to up, or you can or you can use this uh, Python command command line tool or API. Or we can provide a SDK for you to upload uh, your models. But uh, if you want to do this with GUI, you can provide your model name, model description, framework, price, tags, and and the model file. Uh, to upload your models, it's very easy to use. And then after this, we will automatically transfer this model to NOx frameworks and to do this. And uh, this data is that you can just uh, enable this model for users to buy to to look the information on this. And uh, this is the GUI I mentioned to uh, to do the ensemble to how to ensemble these models. So for example, here I don't know if you can see it's very clear. It's, so we can have three different types of models, but maybe I can 
click the zoom this. You can see we have uh, after you order this uh, models, you buy some three models, Gaussian mixed models, random forest, and logistic regression. We will generate three order numbers just like you buy some products on uh, some com commercial website. And then uh, you can do this. This is model ensemble procedure. Ensemble learning is a concept that we will mention later, but you can so you can understand now is that it's a concept to combine different models. And uh, then you can adjust the width by this GUI. You can just uh, freely adjust this width. And then also you can remove from this waiting list or view the details of these models. And uh, you can select your ensemble models, uh, ensemble method here. For example, you use voting, and then you click this ensemble model, uh, ensemble model button, and then we will generate an ensemble model for you to use. So this this scenario too, I mentioned before to use this model market. And uh, also this is some other kind of functions mentioned in this model market, such as you can, here, you can see, you can search these models um, based on different uh, parameters or different fields you want to do. For example, if you select these four fields, model name, framework, tag, purchase time, you can just uh, tap your values. For example, this is 2021, and uh, the system will search these models on this, all of these parameters. So for example, so uh, 2021 is more like the purchase time. So if you input 2021 here, it will search some information here, you can see purchase time. And all the purchase time, uh, all the models uh, whose purchase time is 2021 will be searched uh, for this, uh, instead of this search results. So this is this is basically some engineering techniques uh, to help users to use this friendly, okay. And also we have some pay, uh, pagination. We can you can just uh, sort these models. Okay, you can you can click this button to sort these models, and uh, you can do the uh, you we can uh, do you can select uh, how many pages you want to show. But uh, it's more like the engineering part. Okay, uh, and uh, I will here I will provide a very basic uh, uh, experiment to show how model ensemble can help us to do this. And why we want to do a model ensemble is to see to show that because ensemble learning is that we use different models com uh, collaboratively to train uh, not to train combination combined model but to uh, get a better results uh, in to compare with one single model. Okay, for example, the data set we all know the errors data set is very it's a very classical and simple data set, and this task type is a classification task. And uh, we can do, do this ensemble, um, ensemble experiments. We can generate these ensemble models within one minute. So this is 45 seconds. And this is the uh, three types of models we use. And this is ensemble models with weight of 555 is more like that they all have equal weights. And uh, this is a basic uh, pre precision for these three types of models. For example, so the basic precision is 0 0.93 and 0 0.94 and 82% uh, of this. And the recall and the F1 score. And maybe I think most of you know what is uh, precision means, what is the recall risk, and what is F1 score risk. This is the basic formula for F1 score. So it's very easy to us. So after you ensemble this model, so you, you generate this model, you can see here. Uh, Oh, this is another. After you generate this ensemble model here, we can see uh, this ensemble model can per, can test have a test accuracy of one hundred percent for this error uh, for this error data set or something. So uh, that that means if you only use one model, you can get a per, uh, accuracy, for example, ninety four percent. But if you combine these three models together, you do the ensemble learning, you can get a one hundred percent. But also because this data set is a digital number data set, it's very easy to use. Uh, so it's very very easy data set, very small data set. So it can uh, it can have one hundred percent accuracy, but uh, <laughs> we don't. Uh, in other some bigger data set, we don't even the ensemble learning cannot uh, get access to one hundred percent of accuracy. Uh, the first thing is errors. Uh, this errors is that uh, if you we if we change the um, 
width for this ensemble models. For example, the first time we change the width to five, 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 it means the three types of models, they all have the same equal width. And then we can get an accuracy of 95%. So you should know that under this uh, this this condition, you can see the a single random forest model can get an accuracy of ninety seven percent. But after you ensemble this together, you can only get ninety five or ninety six uh the accuracy. This means that ensemble is not uh, uh, always the best. It's another problem I want to mention is that all is not uh, almost uh, better than most or than single. Uh, and uh, also, you can see here, after you change the, the model width, so in some model width, we can get a higher, a little higher pre precision or accuracy for this ensemble model. So uh, we can see inside this uh, problem, we have many, many research points to use to, to, uh, to, uh, to do this research. For example, the first is uh, because uh, all, is not, uh, all is not better than most for some scenarios. So how to select uh, uh, ensemble selection problem is that if you have three models, oh, you have more models, you have 10 models, you have 100 models, you have these types of models, you use them all, it's not the best. So if we want to just select a part of these models, for example, we only select the 10 models, maybe these 10 models, we after we do the ensemble learning, the performance is better than we use the whole 100 models. And also, you know, the if you do the ensemble learning, you have one model you need to test once. If you have 100 models, you, you should test 100 times for one single symbol. So uh, we need to consider the efficiency also. So for efficiency, it, it means that we need to uh, reduce this uh, inference time for every time you want to do the symbols test. And also another problem is uh, research problem is that how to define how to decide the width of these ensembles. But I will not cover this. I will introduce the ensemble selection problem state. Okay. So this is a, a true basic experiment to show that uh, our model market what we can do now and uh, why it is useful and uh, why we need to do this. Okay. So this the first part has ended right. So, that's basically how we design, how we introduce this uh, basic concept of model market. So we can see that model market is different. Uh, we design is different of this model hub and uh, other, and also it's different for federated linear. And it consider uh, data privacy and uh, it can do many things such as machine learning, such as machine combination, some learning or something. So now I think, uh, and the first part is um, over and do you have any questions now over Zoom or here? I will wait for one minute to for you if you have some questions. And so. Okay, here I just mentioned uh, in the noon, so around 12 o'clock, I will end this session in this morning and uh, we will restart at uh, one o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, uh, you can come to Innovation 4 to have free lunch uh, if you want. But today is a very heavy, heavy rain. So uh, if you want here, you can do this. Okay, nobody has uh, any problems? Okay. I will introduce another, the second part is uh, ensemble learning I mentioned a lot of times before. So what is ensemble learning? I don't know. So I will skip, I will try to skip uh, some technical parts and to help you to understand what is ensemble learning with some basic examples. Okay. So the introduction of ensemble learning is a process I don't know why it's automatically automatically changed to another next page after. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sir. Maybe I check this. I just don't know why it's automatically changed. I don't I don't click mouse, but it will automatically go to the next page. Do you know how to send this? <laughs> I think they're here, but 
So the concept of uh, ensemble linear is a process by which multiple models such as classifiers or experts are uh, strategically generated and combined to solve a particular computational intelligence problem. For example, so ensemble linear is primarily used to improve the, for example, the classification of prediction and the function estimation accuracy, all these kind of things. So the core idea of ensemble linear is used to combine weak linears, so so the base and we call these base models into strong linears, is strong models, and we need to concentrate. Well, here we concentrate our model dealing with the same task. Uh, what do we mean is that we have, for example, we have five models and they all need to classify the models uh, to do some face recognition or digital number recognition or this kind of thing. So they all deal with the same task. And uh, before I think many of the uh, friends, you you can you understand this, you see this figure before. This is a base of variance trade-off. So we know the best is more like the training error or test error. So this is uh, considered as a systematic error that occurs in the machine learning model itself due to incorrect assumptions in the machine learning process. And the best describes how well the model matches the training data set. And the variance is another uh, aspect is that it refers to the changes in the model when using different portions of training data set. And, and the variance is um, variability in the model prediction and how much the model machine learning functions can adjust depending on the given data set. So um, for example, so uh, you can see this figure is that this is the bias and the variance trade-off. If your model is very fit for training data set, for example, you train a model that has 100% accuracy, but uh, if you have these models, it will, it will almost, uh, uh, in most cases, it will have bad performance on the test data set because if you use a linear uh, classifier, it will just uh, meet every line to draw every line to this. Oh, sorry, I don't have a, a figure for this. Maybe I, I need to put, but you, you, you should understand what I'm saying. So if you have very low bias, maybe your model is more specifically designed for this training data set. And when you apply these models to other different types of test set, and you will get a relatively low accuracy or high error because you feel too much for this uh, bias. So this is trade off. But if you have too much variance, you don't have too much local training data set uh, accuracy. So we need to do some trade-off. We want to do this. You can see this test, test error. If we want to get a minimum test error, we need to do not do, do the over, uh, overfitting is it means high variance and not to do the underfitting is a high bias. And we need to get this optimal balance. So the models with high bias will have low variance, the model with high variance will have low case. And it's impossible to have a machine learning models with a low bias and low variance. But we want to find the trade-off to reach this optimal balance. Okay, uh, just I uh, mentioned again, if you have some questions on Zoom or uh, you can just raise your hand or you can just uh, speak via your microphone and I will answer this. Okay, so I will introduce this uh, four types of the ensemble linear techniques uh, to show what can we do, what do we do with this uh, ensemble learning. The first is voting methods. Voting method is very easy to understand, but it has also many, many different types of voting method we want to do. So uh, you can ignore this uh, text and I will introduce by myself that. For example, we have 10 models and uh, we want to do the uh, digital uh, numbers recognition. So one model, so for example, what is voting? It just like, uh, Five of this model, uh, not five, five is equal. So for example, seven of these models recognize these uh, pictures, this image as number one. And the other three uh, recognize this as number two. And because most of the models recognize, recognize these models as number one, then we do a voting. We're voting is that they vote. And then 
uh, based on the weights, so they have the equal weights, for example, then you can just decide this final results of this uh, digital number as number one. So this is very basic uh, uh, way to do this voting. And then I will introduce some um, three types of the voting method. The first is the majority voting. Majority voting is just for a simple XK. The majority voting will can count all the votes. So all the predicted labels from PIEDK by all the member models in an ensemble. And the class received the majority of the votes, more than half, will be selected as the ensemble prediction label. So if no class's votes ex uh, exist half, uh, then the ensemble predicts the symbol as unknown. Uh, so this means that if uh, I just mentioned, if uh, if ten models do this digital number recognition and uh, not uh, so uh, three models recognize as one, the two models recognize as two, and the, uh, the other models recognize as four, five, six, zero, but not uh, a combination group. Uh, the number is five. Uh, it's like the exists half. Is is no group has the number of the five models. Then under this condition, the symbol will be predicted as unknown. So this is. Uh, majority voting we want to this and the uh, plurality uh, plurality voting is a little different with this majority voting is that uh, um, plurality voting is very similar to majority voting it also counts all the votes for the uh, predicted classes for by all member models but under this condition the class received the highest numbers of votes will be chosen as an ensemble prediction model so uh, the majority voting is typically confused with priority voting. Well, but we should know power, um, priority voting does not require majority voting for giving the final um, prediction. It means if if you have three a uh, group with three models and these three models predict this number as one, then the others predict as two, four, five, three, five. Uh, but the the group of three is the largest groups, and you just uh, classify these models as one. Uh, so this figure as one, this image as one. So this is the difference. And the last uh, voting method is the soft voting. This soft voting is more like the average. So soft voting predicts the class uh, label based on the average uh, prediction probabilities uh, as this formula eight uh, shows. Uh, where this uh, this function is from a symbol is a combined combination probability to give the predicted class. Uh, uh, you, okay, I should mention that uh, uh, in the following slides, I will give some formulas, but you don't need to um, understand fully all these formulas because basically in most of the cases, I will give some examples to show how we do this, uh, how we uh, implement this model so some example case. For example, here is this uh, soft voting, how to do. Ignore this Chinese, this is model one, model two, model three, model five, model six, and uh, uh, under these different models, so for example, model, we have two types of the labels. One label is A, the second label is B. We can say one label is A is cat and B is dog, is, can classify one image as dog and uh, cat. And uh, for example, model A, uh, it will provide the probability that uh, we, how, which the probabilities, how many, how much probability, um, probability do you think this image will be uh, label A, so will be cat? And how much the probability will you think, uh, will this model one think that this image is uh, uh, label, label, label? Level one, level B, level B. So, okay, so this is uh, basic uh, probabilities. And this model one to model five, it have different prediction uh, probabilities for different models, uh, for different uh, figures. And then after they get, you get these uh, probabilities, and then you can conduct uh, the final voting that uh, for classification A, you can just uh, add all these predicted probabilities together and uh, uh, divided by five because you have five models and you can get uh, the probability of A is zero point sixty uh sixty one point six percent of this thing and B is uh thirty eight point point four percent. So we can see that the ensemble model thinks that uh, we have sixty one point six percent probability for uh, for this image to be A and uh, um. 
38 is 0.4% uh, probability for this image to be B. And then the final results will be A because this one is larger than this one. Okay, so this is a soft voting. And uh, you can, in most cases, uh, in most cases, we will do um, priority voting because it's very simple and uh, very easy to use and uh, it proves that the results, the performance is good. Okay, so this is the three types of voting methods. And I think it's very easy to understand because um, I do, it's a very uh, straightforward way to do this. We can just uh, tap our head to think of this. Okay, this is the first kind of ensemble learning part is uh, method is the voting methods. The second is begging. Begging is, an, uh, it's, so well, what, why we should, I should mention voting first because voting is a basic technology for many, many, uh, the following methods such as bagging. And uh, what is bagging? We can see here we have some uh, training symbols and uh, we need to do the K for the cross validation for this, this symbol. Uh, but uh, when we do this symbol, we need, we need to use this bootstrap uh, symbols. So bootstrap is a technique to do the symbols and uh, if you learn some probability Statistic courses, you will you will know how to do this bootstrap, and uh, we can see the different color here is that we select uh, different symbols every round uh, by this K for the classification and the bootstrap, and um, for every part of the symbols, we need to put a new classifier for this new new part, a new subset of this uh, symbols. And for example, we use a random forest uh, to train this model. Uh, so this part of data, we use a decision tree to, to train this part of data, and then we use extra trace to, to train this part of data. And after we train many, many n classifiers, one, two, three, two n class, classifiers, then we do the ensemble. And how do we do the ensemble? Uh, it's just that we use the voting. Uh, for the three types of voting methods we use. Uh, okay, just like, uh, then we use the test data here to train the models, uh, to test the models, to, to trust the ensemble classifiers and to get the final predictions here. So this is basically the bagging pre-soldiers. But we should know the bagging pre-soldiers here is a very um, conventional, very classical um, way to do this whole ensemble learning. So what do we do? So we just uh, both uh, symbols, some part of symbols and we train a uh, new classifiers based on this uh, new symbols, and then we do the voting based on this whole classifiers. This is called begging. And this uh, another way to do the ensemble learning is that we don't do not do any symbols. We just uh, train n classifiers. So we train a uh, random forest. We train a decision tree. We train a uh, neural networks. All all the all the training symbols. So we don't do the bootstrap symbols. We just train M uh, classifiers on all these training symbols. And then we do the voting. It's another scheme for, do, for the ensemble learning part. Okay, so this is the begging. And uh, the second and the third is boosting. Boosting, many people may know this GBDT or other boost or XGD boost or this kind of the, this kind of things. So either both is different like the voting. The voting, we can say, if you use voting or backing, you can do this, you can train the different class pairs in parallel. You can do this, you can do the training procedure at the same time. And you, then you do the ensemble class pair. But if you do the boosting, you must do this in a single line. You cannot do this in parallel. You, you must do this step by step. Why is this? Because this boosting method is, this core idea is that we, it will use the sequential dealing with these residual errors. So for example, so you can see here, we have an original data set, and then we train a very weak classifier. For example, we just uh, classifier, use this classifier, so in the SVM or just a linear um, classifier to train this, uh, diff uh, these two types of the uh, data set, uh, two types of data. One is red line, red dot, and the second is blue. But we can see here that uh, after you just train this very big classifier, we can see we have many, many wrong classifications here. Yeah, for example, so the above is we classify all the symbols as red, red dots, and the uh, the below here, below part, uh, the bottom part is that so we classify this as blue part. 
and we can see those for this single hemisphere, this dot, so this dot, and these two dots are classified wrongly. So these two, these three dots are classified wrongly for, uh, for uh, used this V classifier. Then the next step is that we can increase these three data points weight. And after we increase this three data points weight, we train another weak classifier and uh, based on this new increased weights data size. And then we train a new weak classifier to reclassify this uh, this new data set. And then here we can see this is a new generated classifier. And then also we need to do step by step and uh, this weight will be uh, the wrongly classified uh, uh, models, uh, data points will be increased. And uh, then after this epochs many times, we train a weak classifier, we increase the wrongly classified uh, uh, data symbols, and uh, then we train a new classifier, weak classifier T. Then in the end, we combine all these weak classifiers together and to, to show these figures, and then we can get a uh, strong classifiers and can can most pieces classify these model classifiers uh, correctly. So this uh, to ignore this AOC for each class. So this the three types of AOC should be different. But this so this figure is not very good. And then we can get the final AOC for the ensemble model. So we can see because we need to use these residual errors to do the boosting um, procedures. So we this this procedure must to do step step by step, and we cannot do this in parallel. Okay, so this is a boosting method for ensemble learning, and uh, the last one is the stacking. The stacking is a little harder than or a little complex than the uh, before prevent, uh, previous mentioned the three types of ensemble learning part, but uh, it is also very uh, easy to understand if I, if I give you some examples. So the stacking method is that it can learn several different weak learners and. Uh, Combine them by training a meta model to output the predictions based on the multiple predictions returned by these weak models. For example, here, this is the initial data set. And uh, then you can train IO weak learners. So, this IO weak learners, we can see it can be uh, non homogeneous, it can be heterogeneous. Uh, so, different types of models are. Uh, and then, right? Then you need to train this. You need to use the predictions, the predicted results for this error weak learners to generate of the use as the metadata and use this metadata to train a new meta model for this and you get the final prediction. So this meta model is trained to the output predictions that based on weak linear predictions. I will give you a very detailed example for this. And uh, and um, before that, I will introduce more details about stacking. So the, you should learn several different weak learners and combine them by training a meta model to output predictions based on multiple predictions returned by these weak models. For example, for our classification problem, we can choose as uh, weak learners as, such as KN classifier, a logistic regression classifier, and a SOM classifier, and decide to learn a neural network as this meta model in the final layer, uh, final, final step we we mentioned. And then the neural network will take as inputs the outputs of our three weak learners and we'll learn to return final predictions based on it. So the whole step is that we first we split the training data set into two folds. Um, and we choose our weak learners and fit them to data of the first fold. First fold. And for each of the our weak learners, we make predictions for observations in the second fold. And we fit the model, meta model on the second fold using predictions made by weak learners as input. Uh, don't uh, don't take too much attention to this because I will give you more detail to this. For example, here you can see here is a full data set and. Uh, we can train, uh, we can, first we need to split this whole data set to training set and test the data set. And uh, we need to train here, we train the three models, this machine learning model one, machine learning model two, and machine learning model, model three. And uh, every model, uh, the inner part of the procedure is the same, but I, I focus on the first model here. We can see, for the first model, we, we need to do K folder, K folder validation, cross validation. We need to divide the training, uh, data side into four folds, and the, if k is four, we divide this training side 
uh, only the training center not tested into four fold here, one, two, three, four, and then we train the, uh, we train the four different, uh, we get the predictions of this four fold here, and we combine this prediction together to generate a new data set for machine learning model one. And then we just uh, test the data set to, uh, so you can see the text here, the purpose box is obtained by training the entire training set and testing the original data set. And this, then we, we generate a new data set for this new model. And after we generate a new data set, we can have this meta model. So you can see we combine these three types of uh, different uh, prediction together, and then we use this as our input for this motor meta model, and uh, we use this to train uh, the whole pre-soldier and the test side is here. If you don't understand this figure, that's okay. I have another figure for you to understand this uh, whole pre-soldier. But uh, I will explain this. This is the Chinese part, but I will explain it. For example, here, you can have four different parts of mm, models. One is actually that's GB both the that GBM random forest. And so these three types of models. And every time you divide this training set into five parts, training, train one, train two, train three, train four, train five, and you have this test set. And here you can see this left part of this five different uh, training part you you need to train and you need to make predictions. And then you just a stack all this five part of prediction together. And uh, you need to average this five part of the test set uh, uh, together. Then uh, the, the other two models are to conduct the same. And you combine these two, this A1, A2, A3, these three types of models together. And uh, you can stack them together here as a, as this so it has three columns, three dimensions here, the training set. And the labels is the original labels. And then you train this data set with a meta model, such as the linear regression model. And then you can get the you can you can train the meta models. And when you test it, how to test it, you can see here is the test symbols here. So we generate uh, uh, before. And then we just put the first type of of the test set here as B1, and then B2, and B3, and this is a new three-dimensional data set test set for this new uh, data set. And then we just test these symbols and get the final results as the labels. So this is basically uh, how we do stacking for this. Okay, so uh, after this now, I can see I finished the, the whole basic concept of ensemble linear, and I introduced the very, uh, Basic uh, ideas about the voting, about the stacking, uh, voting, bagging, uh, boosting, and stacking. And uh, mainly, most of the cases, we use the boosting and the bagging and the voting very much. And the stacking is a uh, more complex piece of and many people may use it, but it's a little com complicated. Okay, so now. It's 11 o'clock, but I, I need to show another one hour to finish the morning part, and then uh, I will introduce the ensemble selections. So till now, about the ensemble selection part, about ensemble learning part, do you have any questions now? Okay, I will wait for two minutes if you want to have some questions. Maybe I, I should send the PDF to Zoom or to some place for you to check uh, how to do this. I send you a PDF here. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, no, 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 no presentation. Yeah. Okay, okay. So you can, you can check the, the following part and the existing part. So I will start the ensemble selection part in um, eleven one. So I will wait for two minutes. So you can you can download this um, PDF to see what, what question do you have in the past. Yeah. Let's see. Okay.
Oh yeah, I can't change the PDF to, like, to avoid this. Yeah, change PDF. <clears throat> I don't know why if you don't have problems, I will be new. Do you to understand? <laughs> understand what I'm saying? Okay, thank you. Some of them. Okay, if no problems, I will I will continue to have this uh ensemble selection part. So I just mentioned what is ensemble learning. And uh, instead of ensemble learning, I just mentioned uh, there are many, many problems in the studies. One of these problems is ensemble selection. So what is the ensemble selection problem? So the motivation is that we can see the relationship between the ensemble and its components and neural networks is analyzed from the context of both regression and classification. So the conclusion is that, uh, so you know the Zhou Zhihua, the professor Zhou Zhihua from Nanjing University, he published the paper in 2002, and uh, this um, paper means the ensemble neural networks is many, could be better than all. So conclusion is that it may be better ensemble many instead of all the neural networks at hand. This means that if you have 100 models together, and uh, it's not always the best results if you use them all. Maybe you can just select part of this, but you know, you can just select half of this, 50, 50 models. And this 50 models uh, results is good, is better than some results, is better than is, you use the 100 models together. Oh, so this is what we want to do the first thing. So why we want to do in some selection problem. And the other is that, so I just mentioned that, so, because in real scenario, so all the, we have unlimited test data to test. And uh, every one model, every one symbols, we need to do this uh, ensemble selection. So we need to do the predictions. So if you, we do the ensemble learning, so we need to predict uh, this one symbol. So if you, we have, have 100 models, we need to predict this 100, uh, 100 times. If we, we have one thought, we should predict one, one thousand times. It will cost a huge amount of time because you have unlimited test data. So every test data, you need to test 100 times. So it's a very huge cost. So under this motivation, we need, we need still to reduce this inference time and to have similar results, even if it is not better than all selection. I think this is, is worth it, okay? so. Introduction of this ensemble selection is that uh, the purpose of, of the ensemble selection, also known as selective ensemble or ensemble pioneer, uh, is to search for a suitable subset of base classifiers that is better than using the whole ensemble. So in ensemble selection, a single base classifier or an ensemble of classifiers, so which means EOC, can be obtained via static or dynamic approach. So what is the static or dynamic approach? So for static ensemble selection, it selects a fixed subset of the original ensemble for all test instance. It, it means no matter what test instance you provided, it will still select the fixed subset. For example, if you have 100 uh, models and you, uh, you select 10 models, 1 to 10, and uh, no matter what your test instance, we will use 1 to 10 to test this instance. This is means the static uh, ensemble selection. And the, in dynamic ensemble selection is another way. So, so for uh, dynamic ensemble selection, the base, base learners are selected on the fly through a specific evaluation creation according to each test instance to be classified. And it means for every so the, the, uh, every test in, uh, instance, we will select a different uh, group of um, ensembles to do the ensemble process. So, uh, oh, of course, we know the second is more interesting, more sexy, but here we will focus on the take uh, ensemble selection first. Yeah. And for uh, 
Let's take uh, some of the action methods. There are three basic types of uh, methods we can here, mention here. The first is a search-based. The search-based type is that we can employ heuristics to search through the space of possible baseline or combinations to maximize some evaluation creation. It means we can do this uh, selection uh, problems greatly. So why, we, why should we do this? Because you know it's an empty hard problem for we to select examples. Why? Why is that? For example, if you want to select ten, uh, if you have ten models, and uh, if you want to select uh, some of the models, you have how many? How many combinations do you have? You have two, two to the square of tens. For example, one thousand and twenty-three. Uh, these times, and if you have one hundred models, the combination you have two to the one hundred. Uh, 100 percent times so all these types of groups so you cannot test them all and uh, to get the best results because it's too many because it's a uh, uh, exponential increase when the model numbers increases so you must uh, to do some greedy algorithm to do this so this is a search based and the second is a rank based Rank based is that you can sort the candidate based layers according to some evaluation metrics and then select a predefined number of base layers according to the sorting order. Don't, don't, don't care too much about this text because I will give some examples later. Okay, the third is the cluster based. So the cluster based is that we first uh, we use this unsupervised learning algorithms are employed to partition base uh, layers into clusters of models and make similar predictions. And uh, each cluster is then separately pruned in order to increase the overall diversity of the ensemble. And uh, this part is what I want to focus to so use the diversity to conduct the ensemble selection problem. Okay, so. First, I will introduce this search-based method example. So what is a search-based? This is the very first paper to uh, show the search-based example. So you can see we can use a very simple greedy algorithm to select the ensembles. Because uh, uh, you should know that this, this is ensemble selection problems in not, not consider the local data privacy. So we can get the local data accuracy. We can get access to local data set. But we, you, you can have some research in the future that uh, how can we do this in some selection. Actually, this is what I uh, what I'm researching on this. So if you cannot access have access to this local data set, how can you do this in some selection procedure? Uh, so, uh, but but uh, you you should know under this <laughs> problems uh, this what I mentioned here is that. Uh, uh, they can all have access to this local data set and they, they use this local data set to select this ensemble. So for example, this part is that you first start with an empty ensemble, and then you add to the ensemble the model library that maximize the ensemble's performance to the error metric on the hill climb validation side. So you understand this time is that First, uh, you don't have any uh, models inside this ensemble. Then, you have, if you have 100, model, uh, 100 models, you select the best models, best local validation models to this side. And then you can have, for example, I can click here. So for example, here you can 100 model, one, two, three, four, five here. And then the ensemble side here is an empty have, uh, file. And then uh, you select the best uh, models here one for you from one, two, three, four, five. For example, this four is the best. And you input four here. And then you the remaining models are one, two, three, and five. One, two, three, and five. And then you need to test uh, if four one is the best, or four two is the best, or four three is best, or five five is best, and then you select this. For example, four two is best, and then you add two to this. Okay. Uh, and, and if you want to finally you want to select three models here, and then you can just test if two four one is the best, or two four three is the best, or two four five is the best. For example, if two four five is the best, and then you add five here, and then this is the basic. Uh, basic procedure about how you select this ensemble selection. So it's very easy to understand, I think. Okay, so this is a basically search-based method. So it's a continually, greedily search the best models inside this current uh, to improve this ensemble selection. And uh, all three, so the, the third step and first step is basically what I mentioned here, I will not repeat. Okay. 
So this is the first type. The second type is a rank based method example. So it's origin, uh, orientation ordering. And uh, uh, based on this uh, rank based method here, we need to do some, uh, to predefine some signature value uh, vector, uh, some vectors. The first is the signature vectors. It's a binary vector with one entry for each training observation and taking the value of one if the observation is correctly classified or zero or otherwise. Uh, so, for example, you, you have five symbols here. Uh, so this vector is that uh, if this classifier you classify this correctly, you, you, sorry. Uh, if you classify it correctly, you put one here, like this. And then if you not correctly, you put zero here and correctly, you put five. So for these five symbols, so this classifier correct, the first is correct, and the second is not correct. So the, this is a signature vector. And then the second is the ensemble signature vector. It's the average of all base layers of signatures and represents the voting ensemble with prediction accuracy. So this is, this means that if this is the second second classifier, I think it is fine. That means one, zero, one, one, zero. And then the ensemble is that's uh, one, zero, zero. Uh, oh, no, 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 not zero, sorry. Uh, one, zero point five, yeah, because you need to take the average and the one and the zero point five. Okay, because you need to, for, for example, here, this one, this one, uh, you average on this two and you get zero point five. Yes, this is the ensemble of the signature vector. Okay, so the the third is a reference vector. It's a vector or signal to the ensemble the signature vector. It's just like, uh, for example, the ensemble vector is uh, in the how to, how to say how to say the zoo row, Zhao Xian. Zoo row, how to say? Axis. 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 I don't know. Use this figure, and this is vector. This is the ensemble. Signature vector here, and then the reference vector is that this vector you, okay, and then this the, the or second to this ensemble signature vector, and then the base layers are ordered according to the angle between their uh, signature vector and the reference uh, vector. Only these five basic layers with angles less than. Uh, two point of five radians are included in the ensemble. Uh, what do we mean? So we can see uh, here. Uh, so you, you need to, to see these base layers with angles. So we can have the signature vector one, signature vector two. So for example, this, uh, we know this is ensemble vector, this is reference vector. And uh, this, for example, this vector is the first vector, first base vector here. And uh, this is the second, for example. Uh, I just randomly say selected. And then we need to compare with the angles, so the angles between this their signature vector and the reference vector. So we need to calculate the. Uh, maybe I can change the color. Uh, okay, okay, I skip it. So, so this angle, if this angle is less than twenty percent, so two to one pi, then we include uh, this ensemble into the ensemble site. If not, we do not do not include this. So this is a, a rock-based uh, example. And in uh, essence, this method gives pre preference to base layers that correctly classify instance misclassified by the full ensemble. So you can see this. So understand this? Okay. Uh, so the last one, uh, not the last one, <laughs> the most important one I think is a cluster-based method. What is a cluster-based method? Is that we first we use unsupervised learning algorithms that are employed to partition base layers into clusters of models that make similar predictions based on diversity. And each cluster is then separately pruned in order to increase the overall diversity of the ensemble. Uh, why do we want to do this? So what I mentioned is that we want to use the diversity to to do this ensemble selection, but why we want to do use, use the diversity? So what is the diversity used for? And then we need to first to introduce the importance of the diversity for ensemble selection. So some also present a theoretical study on the effect of diversity in voting. I, I will not uh, <laughs> cover this theoretical analysis, but you, you, you need to know that this, this, this picture about this article 
they, these people, they say that they provide a theoretical study to show that uh, the diversity in voting is important. So they concluded that by enforcing large diversity, the hypothesis-based complexity of voting can be reduced, and then better generalization performance can be expected. So after we have this, this conclusion, we can use diversity to do the ensemble selection. So the intuition of this diversity is that these classifiers with low diversity should not belong to the same ensemble. Uh, why should we do this? For example, so we have uh, we have uh, three models, for example, but one, two of the models, if all the models are the same models, and uh, it means that this ensemble will have very, very low diversity, you know, because they are the same, the diversity is zero, I can say. Uh, so diversity is a difference. So we have three the same models, and if we put these three models together inside the same ensemble, it's just like the, the, the single model in your analysis, because you have model A, you have another model A, you have the second, third model A. This ensemble set, it will produce, it, it is as the same as a single model A, it's a different. So the diversity here is, is zero, so there's no diversity, the similarity is 100%. So we want the whole, we, at least we want this whole ensemble, for example, have A, B, C. So this diversity is high, and the, uh, at least they can have different openings uh, based on um, different uh, symbols. So this is where we want to calculate the diversity of the models. Okay, so now I will introduce many popular model similarity measurement metrics, or model diversity measurement metrics. So it's the same similarity is offset on the diversity. Okay. So the diversity metrics is that uh, we consider, uh, so now uh, I repeat again, we have access to the local data set, but uh, in model market, we don't have access. But so I will, now the paper is not published. Uh, after I publish, <laughs> you can check my paper that's how we can do this calculated diversities uh, with these models based uh, without this local data set. But uh, the following part I will introduce in this section, in this uh, PhD teach PhD defense uh, in a workshop. I will introduce how to use this uh, local data set to calculate the diversities of this different uh, um, classifiers or different models. So we consider base model pool M, uh, we in total have M base models and all trend on the same data set. So you need to, see, you need to understand this, all these models are trend on the same data set for the same linear, linear tasks. So like X, X is X zero to X n minus one is a set of randomly select n uh, label the negative symbols from the training data set. What is labeled the uh, negative symbols? For example, is we have a bi um, binary, binary classification problem to classify if this picture, this figure is dog or is not dog. We all have two labels. One is dog, two is not dog. And uh, if the picture, if the figure image we said is dog, it means this is, this is a positive, symbols. And then this figure, when this figure is not dog, it means it's uh, labeled uh, negative symbols. So this is where we want to do this. And from the training set. Okay, so for a base, uh, for a base model FI, so we use here, we use FI as a base model. And the negative symbol set X, X here. FI will out, output a vector of binary values on X, denoted as this omega I as this omega i zero to omega i minus one, and omega i k is one if i fi predicts x correctly, otherwise. Oh, it's just like this symbol is the same as this, the same as this, this signature vector. So for example, if you have five, you have five, uh, for example, this uh, example, uh, example is that uh, one, two, one, three, one, one, two, three, and one, two, three, four, this diversity is high and the uh, accuracy will be high. But well, it's another concept. So for example, this omega i, so omega i. So we have f1 to uh, f0 to, to, to f5, for example. We have six models. And uh, omega zero is at the first uh, uh, vector here, omega i. Omega i and then uh, if it's one, one, zero, zero, one, it means that uh, it classifies the first uh, symbol size correct as, as dog, for example, here, and the third uh, symbols facing this is not dog, okay. 
So this is vector omega i vector x and uh, fi. Okay. And the uh, sample search uh, is somewhere, somewhere here. And uh, after we have this, we can introduce some types of the uh, diversity measures. So how to calculate the different types of diversities? Uh, the first is very simple uh, method. So do you know this is a confusion matrix? Confusion matrix is that we can have two classifiers, fi and fg here. And uh, this confusion matrix is n one one means that uh, how many symbols that uh, both fi and fg classified this these symbols as one? So as correct. As, uh, this is not correct or wrong. You can see that it's uh, not correct or wrong and, and it's positive and negative. For example, this is dog and uh, this is not dog. Oh, not dog. Okay, this is dog. This is not dog. So F1 and F2, one, 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 zero, zero. One zero zero one one. Okay, for example, we have two of this, and then this figure will be this FG one one, and then now FG F one F two one one F two one zero F two one zero. Okay, so we will count how many symbols they both classified as one, only one here. And how many they classify the uh, F1 as one and F2 as zero? One, two, yes. Okay, how many F2 is zero, F1, F, F2 is one, F2 is zero? Uh, F2 is one, F2 is zero, two. How many they, uh, two, sorry. How many they both classified as zero? Zero, uh, we don't have any symbol that uh, they both classified as zero. So this is a basic concept of confusion matrix here. And then the n here, you know, is that the total number of the symbols for the one, I two, I two is five, is that total, total number of the symbols here, okay. Uh, okay, after we have this confusion mix matrix, this is, this is very important and, and then most of the matrix calculation method will use this confusion matrix to calculate the diversities. And we need to calculate the with how much the diversity of these two figures, uh, these two models. So the very easy way is just that you count. You, you can see here, here this one means that this N11 means that they both classify these symbols as correct. And this uh, N00 zero zero is that they both classify as not uh, uh, as wrong or not at all. This, these two numbers add together is that how many symbols they both agreed uh, as the same label. So these two, N01, N110, these two, the, we add these two together. It means that uh, how many symbols they disagree with each other, okay? So we add these two together and we divide it by, this is N, so this is just uh, the sum of the all symbols. So we just uh, count. So this binary disagreement is very easy. So we just count how many label, how many symbols they, these two classifiers disagree with each other. So the binary disagreement uh, is defined as a ratio of the number of the symbols on which one model is correct while the other number is wrong. And uh, two, the total number of the symbols predicted by two models FIFG in formula six. Okay, so we can see high, this high binary disagreement means a high diversity and a high disagreement of the two models. So I think it's very easy to understand, uh, very easy to calculate. And then the second is Cohen's Kappa. So Cohen's Kappa is a little harder to understand, but I will try my best to help you to understand why we use Cohen's Kappa, Kappa instead of this binary uh, binary disagreement. Why we use Cohen's Kappa? So I will first introduce this formula and then I will give you an example. So don't be afraid that you want to understand this. Okay. Uh, 
It's okay. So the cones kappa measures the diversity between a pair of classifiers F i and F d from the perspective of the ag agreement. Also, a lower cones kappa value indicates lower agreement and higher diversity. So its definition kappa i g between a pair of classifier F i g, uh, F i and F d is shown in formula four. And the value of cones kappa ranges from minus one to one, where zero represents the amount of agreement by random chance. Uh, you don't need to understand this. Uh, I will explain that later. Okay. Why we need to, uh, we need a cons kappa instead of this binary this agreement? For example, here we have a data set. This data set has 10 cats and 90 dogs. And if I mark, so if I, because you know, we, we, should, we need to train this. This is a training set. Training set. So if, if, we, if, if I just uh, know this distribution here, I know that this data set has 10 cats and 90 dogs. And so for, for a classifier here, for a model or classifier, I don't train this model at all. I don't train this classifier at all. But I know that this data set has 10 cats and 90 dogs. So it has a lot of dogs. Then I just say that this classifier, I just, I just use the APG. Uh, no, if, if sentence, sorry, <laughs> I just use, uh, I just classified all the symbols as dogs. I don't classify any of the symbols as cats. So 100, because I know this. So if we, you do this, if I mark all enter symbols as dogs with existing training distribution, we can, basically we can have get accuracy of 90%. You know that. You can, you can see the baseline is 90%. It's just you didn't train the classifier, just uh, you just uh, classified all the symbols as dogs. So if you know this training distribution, you can get uh, the accuracy of 90%. So this baseline is 90%. So how to evaluate uh, the real accuracy improvement to the trend models? Because uh, if you, after you train these classifiers, you have used, for example, you get 98% uh, of accuracy, but you cannot see that your, your, class, your classifier is good. For example, in this condition, you can you you get a classifier that get a ninety one percent accuracy. Ninety one percent is is a, a absolutely bigger value because ninety one percent is near one hundred. But if you know that the baseline is ninety percent, you you can see that is, this classifier is not very good because the baseline can achieve ninety percent and you can only improve one percent. But not we we calculate the improvement here. Uh, so. So how to how do we calculate the real improvement of this? You can use this score. So it's just like the one minus accuracy uh, divided by one minus the baseline and uh, one minus this whole value. For example, huh? Yeah, okay. Why, why, why we use this my score formula? You can see when accuracy is one, so the real accuracy we get one is one. We can say my score is one. When accuracy is 0 0.9, it means that it's the same accuracy as baseline. This my score will be zero. So it means that uh, the real accuracy, you can measure this. If you can only get a 90% of accuracy, then your real, your real accuracy improvement is really zero. You don't improve this at all. And if you can get a 100% of accuracy, then your improvement will be 100. So this is the iteration of why we use Cohen's kappa. So the Cohen's kappa also consider the, the local data science training distribution. Okay, so this is a detailed example about how we do how to calculate the Cohen's kappa. Note that this, uh, this formula for this formula is just the same as this formula from Wikipedia. I do a conversion, I calculate this manually, and I say, oh, this is the same. And I will use this one, this one, as to introduce how to, how to, how do you do this? How to calculate the diversity of Cohen's kappa. So the first, this P0, uh, PO, and not P0, PO. PO is accuracy. Accuracy here, you can see. Accuracy is that, uh, not accuracy, I think. The A and the B are two different, uh, two different uh, models, but, uh, but because in Wikipedia, this says this A is a classifier model and uh, B is a real label. Real label. So, so here, so they said A, this is uh, accuracy. Actually, they, you can see this is uh, 
BD, uh, binary agreements in a uh, PA, the binary agreement. So, so, so they agree how many symbols they both agree at the same label, the same label. So PO equals to A M plus D minus to the A minus D minus uh, A plus B plus C plus D. So the total number of symbols. Okay. So the P E is a uh, is a hypothetical probability of chance agreements using the observed data to calculate the probability. So each observer randomly seeing each category. Uh, this this sentence you should understand very carefully. So what do do we mean? So this P E, but the P E how to calculate this is P S plus P no, and how to calculate the P S? Oh here, you can see uh, here this. Um, one minute, and uh, P S is and can you see A minus A plus B divided by A uh, plus B plus C plus D. How how why we do this, and A minus D. So we can see the P part, uh, and we can see this. So the left part here, so A, A minus B, uh, A plus B, is that uh, how many symbols that this model A classified uh, as correct? And then divided by the A, uh, the whole number of symbols is that the accuracy of A, uh, and then you times an A plus C here to the whole numbers, a plus B plus C plus D is that the total numbers the model B classified the um so accuracy I can see not accuracy the positive pro positive proportion of this so it means like the this is uh, how many dogs A classifies and this is how many dogs B classifies correctly and uh, when we just the times this multiply 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 these two accuracy together it means that it's, uh, uh, what is the accuracy that you just uh, based on this local training distribution, you can calculate the best uh, accuracies. And then this is a uh, PS and P no is the same. You can just use C plus D and uh, B plus D and divided by A minus plus B plus C plus D. And then you add these two probability together. So it is a uh, hypothesis hypothetical probability of the chance agreement. So you will see the observer data to calculate the probabilities of the randomly seen each category. So if you understand this very carefully about this, how, how, how you calculate the cost comma. So it's just like the expanded version of this formula. So, so you, can, you can understand this, it's, it's not very good. So this is how we calculate the cost comma otherwise this uh, formula means. And then this is a detailed example about the constant Hapa. Uh, for example, we have uh, model A, we have uh, 20 symbols and model A and model B, they both say yes. And uh, then I will kind of have this confusion matrix with, I don't repeat it. Okay. And then we can calculate this PO first, use this formula as this zero and seven. Okay, so now you can understand what I'm seeing this just now about uh, this formula. So, so to calculate the BE, so the probability of random agreement, we know that so reader A here said yes to 25 applicants uh, and no to 25 applicants. Thus, reader A says yes 50% of the time. And then reader B said yes to 30 applicants and no to 20 applicants. And then the reader B says yes 60% of the time. So the expected probability that both would say yes to random is you calculate use this formula and you get this 0 0.3. And similarly, P no is 0 0.2. And the overall random agreement probability, the probability that they agreed on either yes or no. Uh, so you add these two probabilities together and you get P as 0 0.5. And then the end, you will calculate the cohort kappa here. And you use this formula with P O here, P O here, and the P here. Yes, P here. And then you use this formula, and then you get this. The end, you get this cost kappa value. And the cost kappa value, you, you should understand, it's just uh, the same as this max score. So if the, you get 100% of accuracy, your real uh, improvement will be one. And if you get 0% of accuracy improvement, so you, your score, your cost kappa will be zero. And uh, uh, this is the perspective of the. Uh, accuracy improvement and uh, for two models 
So we just because because before we treat this model A as a model, model B as a label. But if we treat the model A and the model B as two different models, it will be the how how much how the difference of the models difference. For example, if this my score is one, it says that the diversity is very high. And if my score is zero, it means that the diversity is the same. Okay. So this is, this means that uh, the value of cones kappa ranges from minus one to one, where zero reference amount of agreement by random choice. So this is the cones kappa. You can you can you can check the slides I uploaded on the uh, okay. But I just mentioned three types of the let me string first and then so. This is three types of the diversity calculation method, but we should know that if we have 100 models, we don't want to only select two, uh, two ensembles, uh, two models, for example, one to two. We want to select many, many models. Okay. We want to select many, many models, for example, we want to select one, three, three models. So, but these three methods I just mentioned can only calculate uh, Pairwise to pairs to the pair to pair is uh, is that you will com 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 compare the diversity compute the diversity of one and two one and five one two and five and this and if we want to calculate the whole diversity of this whole ensemble group is selected how should you do this that means you should uh, just uh, use this one two with the diversity of one two minus diversity of one five minus diversity of one two five together. Minus three is like uh, the accuracy to do this. So this is the whole diversity. This is the whole diversity inside this whole ensemble group. So if you use this pair to pair cluster uh, diversity calculation method, you need to use this formula. So I do the average and so add this pairwise and pairwise diversity together, divided by the total number of the combinations and you get the final diversity uh, for the whole group. Okay, but uh, there are also some methods that you can directly calculate the whole diversity uh, for the whole groups, not pair to pair, but uh, you calculate it together. So there are another three types of the Cohen's Kappa, uh, non cost disagreement of similarity calculations. The first term, is flexi kappa. Okay, this is another kappa. So it's basically, I see this is the same as Cohen's kappa, but it, uh, you can see this formula is very similar to Cohen's kappa. It's just like this is many models. It, it is, for Cohen's kappa, you can only calculate the diversity of the two models. But for flexi kappa, you can calculate the diversity of many models, three models, four models, five models. And, uh, but you should note the Core conception or core idea of this Valencia Kappa is the same. It's just like the expanded version of Cohen's Kappa. So I will not tell you the details, but I will also give an example. So I will read this first. So similar to Cohen's Kappa, Valencia Kappa also measures the diversity from the perspective of the agreement. So the difference is that, difference is that it can be directly calculated for TMO2 or more models for formula eight show here, uh, where P bar, P bar here is the average classification accuracy for the ensemble team, and the kappa is not simply obtained by average in the cones kappa. And so these two formulas are usually ignored because I mean, and if if your team number I only have two models, it's the same as cones kappa. So it's just the expanded. Oh, okay. So this is if you use classic kappa, you have some parameters to show and uh, the. Uppercase N is number of symbols. Man, uh, lowercase N is number of classifiers. So it's S here. And then K is the number of labels, K is to two here. And then first, we need to calculate the PJ is the proportion of all assignments which were the GIS category, the PI, how to calculate. I will not, uh, I will not uh, detail this because it's almost the same as cross kappa you can understand. And now we calculate the PI the extent to which readers agree with the I subject. And now we compute how many reader reader pairs are in agreement relatively to the number of possible reader reader pairs and you calculate this. And uh, and then you calculate the P bar, you miss PIS and the PE which go into the formula for kappa. And uh, you don't you don't need to know too much about this. And uh, you can see if you just uh, 
here we have five models here, and we have 10 symbols here. And this is a very big uh, confusion matrix. So this zero, it means uh, there is no symbols at the, 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 the table one, the model one classified as one or things. Okay, so this is uh, the symbol. And then after the calculate the formula, you can calculate the PI, you can calculate the PI, uh, PG here, and then see tables. And uh, N is 10, N is 14, K5 of some of all cells is this summarizes. Uh, so you can check this fancy couple of where Wikipedia. This is a same uh, example from Wikipedia, and uh, I will not cover this exam uh, examples uh, in detail because uh, although it seems very complicated, but uh, the core idea of this fancy kappa is just the same as Cohen's kappa. So if you understand Cohen's kappa, you can uh, cost some ten minutes to understand this this symbols and to understand what is fancy kappa. So it's basically the same idea. Okay, this is a uh, fancy kappa we want to do. And uh, okay, I will finish this, uh, the, the, the other two, not pairwise, non pairwise. Sorry, I misclassified. This is non pairwise, not, not, uh, not uh, uh, this is non pairwise, sorry. Huh? Uh, non pairwise, it's not pairwise, sorry. Uh, but don't worry, you can, you can see this. Mm. I will finish. Uh, I still have two, uh, three statistics to show us. But after I finish this, we will, we will have a free lunch. And uh, no matter where you know, you can go to innovation for the level two to have a free lunch today. Yeah, okay, at, at, at lunch. Uh, okay, so this Q statistics. The Q statistics is defined as QSIG in Formula 5 of all parallel models and parallel and free FG. The value of QSIG varies between minus one and one. And when the models have FG and FG are stat you, you should know the core idea here is that when two classifiers of models are statistics independent, the expected QSIG value is zero. If both models tend to recognize the same input symbol similarity, QSI will have a possible positive value for two diverse models recognizing the same input uh, symbol di differently, and it will render a small or negative QS value. And this is, this is the formula. And you don't need to understand this. I will, I will, I will connect this. Okay, so what does this formula mean here? Okay, I will introduce here. You can see this is a confusion matrix for uh, two models, two models A and B, and this is uh, true, this is false. So the, TATB, you notice TATB is not a TA minus TB, it's not a TA minus TB, it's, it's not this. It's just a symbol TATB. Okay, it says is the TATB is a number that both model A and model B classified, uh, so how many symbols they classified both as, as uh, uh, true, as uh, correct. So it's it's just the same idea, the same as uh, uh, confusion matrix. Okay. So if we have this confusion matrix, we then we should we should know that if a if a and b are independent, we know that from the statistical probability concept, if these two uh, random variables are independent, we have this uh, probability p t a t b. There's no p t a p t b is means this this is this one not p t a minus t b. So this one p t a b t b. This probability is PTA minus PTB, uh, not minus multiply the times PTB. If these two variables are independent, it's a basic concept. Okay, so we have this. So then PTA TB equals to PTA uh, minus um, uh, times TB. Then we can say that so if we have this, we assume that the independent, and we divided this left part and right part by n. You can see this. So PTA TB. Uh, not not divided. Well. PTATB is PTATB is TATB minus n minus uh divided by n, and the PTA is the TA divided by n, and PTB is TB divided by n. Okay, so we have this formula, and then we just uh, multiply. So we just multiply n here, and then we multiply n here, and then we we just uh, I don't know dismiss this. And then we can we can add the formula that's uh, TA minus TB, uh, TATB, not TA minus TB. So the TATB minus N equals to TA 
times TV. Not minus, uh, why, why I should keep seeing minus is times. TATV times NX to TA times TV. And this TATV, you know, is a single value. So this means that uh, the chance of this, the chance of they both predict the symbol as true is a product of the chances of predict the symbol as true by either of them separately if they are independent. Okay, so we have this formula. And then if we have TA, TB, so we have we have this formula, then we will have, we can say we can TA, FB. Uh, so this is just the same, just uh, the same uh, induction inference procedure as this. You can get these three similar formula here. TFB times N equals to TA times FB. FATB times N equals to FA times TB. FAFB times N equals to FA times FB. Okay. And then uh, uh, we should prove, uh, I will give a simple proof of this. TA times FB equals to TA because FB. You know FB here, here is FB, FB here is N minus TB, you know, N minus TB. This is really minus N minus TB. Okay, so FB is N minus TB, so TA times N minus TB then equals to TA times N minus TA times TB, <laughs> minus so TA times N minus, uh, you can see this, and after you just get this formula, and then you can get that TA times FB equals to N times TA FB. And the other three formulas are the same, you can get the same. And uh, why we should do this is that uh, if we have this uh, formula, we can also have this formula. Okay, so TA, TB times FA, FB equals to TA, FB equal times to in FAFB, why, why, why is that we should use the formula we just uh, calculated? We, 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 should, we just know that TATB times N times uh, FAFB times N equals to TATB times N times FAFB. So we have, have, have formula one and formula two. And the, so we can see that formula one is equal to formula two. So these two part is the same. This part uh, and this part is the same. And uh, we divided these two part by N square. And then we can have this TATB times FFB equals to TFB times FATB. Okay, so after we have this formula, we can, you, you need to show this Q here. Q here is this formula. So I, I should explain why Q, Q statistic is useful. So when we assume that the model A and model B, they, they, these two models are independent for predicted symbols. And we have this formula, we can understand this, this whole formula. And then A and B are independent, so we have this formula, and then Q is zero. You can see this? Because they are independent, and then you calculate it here. TATB times FAFB, because they are equals this, minus this is equal to zero. So if they are independent, this Q is minus, is this Q value is zero. Okay. So if A and B are not independent, so when we, we need to know if Q is uh, bigger than zero. So this value is bigger than zero. And this value is bigger than zero. It means that uh, this one is bigger than this one because this one is always positive. So this one is, the left part is bigger than the right part. So what does this mean? So this means this part is bigger than this part. And this part is by bigger than this part, uh, statistically A and B are positively correlated. You can, you can see this because it's the proper probability of the TATB, probability of FB. So this means this is this probability is how, what is the probability that both uh, model A and model B agree with each other. And this is the probability that both uh, model A and model B disagree with each other. So if this left part is bigger than the right, right part, it means that they are positively correlated. It means that it has more, um, more agreement than disagreement. And then if Q is less than zero, and uh, similarly, similarly A and B are negatively correlated. So this is what we do with, what we consider the Q statistics. So why Q statistics is, is good. Okay, so uh, I have, okay, we have 10 minutes left and we will have lunch and then you can feel free to go to uh, innovation form. Okay. The next one is uh, generalized diversity GD. So this is, uh, I can see it has only three formulas here. And it, 
it will be very easy to understand that. So the generalized diversity were proposed by some authors at Formula 10. Yeah, so why is a random variable and representing the proportion of the classifiers otherwise that fail to recognize a random uh, variable symbol X. And PI denotes the probability of Y equals to I divided by S. That is the probability of I otherwise classifier recognizing randomly randomly chosen symbol X, uh, XK incorrectly. And the P1 here is represented as the expected probability of one randomly picked model failing. And uh, while P2 is the expected probability of both two randomly picked models failing. And uh, maybe the, the, the text is very, very long, but uh, it's very easy to understand. For example, so here, S is as uh, how many different uh, symbols you have. So how many models you have, this I is a specific model, and this PI is the uh, probability of Y. And uh, this P1 is like uh, the expected probability, one randomly. So you r randomly pick the one model and uh, it fails, this is, uh, you can you can understand it later, but uh, it means that uh, if you you have for example you have five models so one two three four five and uh, you randomly pick the one model and uh, it will fail on this uh, on this test symbol uh, so it it will fail the correctly classified this, this symbol so the probability is p one and p two it means that uh, if you select uh, randomly select two symbol uh, two models uh, in, uh, within these five models and uh, these two models they both fail on this test symbol so this is the probability of the two symbols so this is the uh, meaning of the p2 and then the gd here is one minus p2 divided by p1 why why, sh why should we calculate that like this because as uh, if we can see um uh, here the so maximum diversity one can be reached when the failure of the one model is accompanied by the correct recognition by the other model for two randomly picked models, which corresponds to P2 equals zero. And uh, both two randomly, while when two, both two randomly picked models fail, we have P1 equals P2 corresponding to minimum diversity zero. What does this mean? So we can calculate, calculate the GD. So if we randomly pick this, for example, one, two, three, four, five, uh, this five models, we randomly pick the two models. For example, we pick the three and the five, and then they both fail. So no matter what, what the two models we 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 pick. For example, we pick a three, four, a one, two. They will all fail. It it, it means that if you select the three and the, the if three fails, the five will fail. If three fails, the four will fail. If one fails, the two will fail. It means that. Uh, for this examples, they agree with each other very much. So they both agree that they both will fail. So no matter what you select, uh, what selection you select, you select one, one, two, you select one, five. And uh, no matter what you select, if one fail, the other will fail. If this is, and then the diversity is very low. His diversity is that they almost agree with each other. And uh, the opposite is uh, there is that uh, if one, and uh, one fails, the other must have to or almost uh, so always be correct. And so one fails will be accompanied by one another success. So if this condition that is that no matter how you choose these two models, it will one is, one will fail, one will success. It means the whole selection, the diversity is very high, the maximum high. So this is what uh, this generalized uh, diversity, this measurement means to do this. So you can you can download this slide and to understand this whole paragraph very carefully, but this is it's very easy formula to understand. It's just like P2 minus uh, divided by P1. Okay, so let me finish this uh, last uh, non pairwise diversity matrix and then we will start, uh, we will have a rest at lunch from 12 to uh, one o'clock in the afternoon. And in the afternoon, I will introduce some papers, use this diversity matrix and uh, to uh, calculate the ensemble selection problems. Okay, so this is the last one. This is the Kohavi Robert variance, KW. And uh, Kohavi Robert variance measures the uh, variability of the predicted class Labels for the symbol XK within the team of the models FI, F1 to FS4 is formula 9 uh, shows a higher value of KW variance implies a higher ensemble diversity of the team. Okay, uh, don't, 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 
uh, to share this. Oh, what does this mean? Huh? Okay, so L, can I see L? L here. You can see L key denotes the number of the classifiers that correct to correctly recognize XK. For example, I, uh, that, that is to say L XK equals to the um, I man, uh, from one to I. Okay, it means that uh, for example, you have two symbols and not one symbol. Uh, this uh, zero one and then omega uh, L L X zero. So this is x zero x zero equals to uh, e r. It's very easy. So only one classifier. Oh, okay, we can have the third classifier. Okay, you can see we have three classifiers and two classifiers. L x L x zero is two. It means two classifiers classified uh, this uh, symbol x zero. I is the correctly correctly recognized as okay. So this is what uh, LK means. And the S equals to three here. X is the total number of classifiers. And uh, you can see, uh, uh, so uh, it's a very simple formula here. So if LSK equals to S minus LSK, we can get uh, the maximum, maximum value of KW. Because you know this is, uh, if you take a directive, uh, derivative. This is this one and the numbers. Okay, you can see. So, how to say this is more like the here. You can see if this, uh, if LK equals to S minus LK, you can get the maximum value here. Okay. Uh, then, when that is to say, when half of the S classifiers predict the symbol K as one, and another half predict as zero, so the KW is the largest. It's very too easy to. To understand, to understand this this formula. So okay, so this method measures the group diversity from the perspective of the various labels. If you want to see the uh, inner of the these how uh, tips uh, how how they do this because they can this is a variance. So this variance is uh, from the statistic part, and then you calculate the uh, how the samples uh, the probability of the a marginal probability of the one x one one x two and you substitute this to this and you can get the variance here and then you can get this kw uh, i don't think you, you should care about this this is the theoretical part you, you just need to remember that uh, when half of the ice classifier predict the symbol k as one and another half predict it as zero kw is the largest you 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 understand this is enough of this. Okay, this is all for this six months. I will have a conclusion and then we have lunch. Okay. So the first uh, uh, is a binary disagreement. It's just a simple counter difference of predictions. And the second is coins kappa is a Paris and it captures the real improvement degree of agreement. And the flexi kappa is not Paris and it's similar as coins kappa but it's just in the perspective of the whole group. And the Q statistic is a pairwise one, it captures the dependency relationships of two models, is statistically perspective. And the generalized diversity is a non pairwise, it similarizes Q statistics, but it is a perspective of the whole group. And then the last one is KW variance, is a non pairwise, it measures the group diversity from the perspective of variance of levels. Okay, this is uh, all for the uh, diversity calculation method by the other side. And we still have two minutes to try one. Do you have any questions on Zoom or here? I will wait for two minutes. If you have any questions about diversities, uh, about ensemble selection programs, I will explain in this. If no, we have a have lunch. I will wait uh, until 12 o'clock. Mm. And uh, in the afternoon, we will start at one o'clock uh, and uh, we will introduce some uh, SOTA papers about uh, ensemble selections, but with data set. So, uh, so not consider privacy. And then the last part is the model search problem so that we can uh, user submit a data set and then, uh, then, then we search recommended models for them. And you can download the, the PDF I send and you go.
Okay, it's time to call. Okay, if no one has problems, we will stop here and uh, we will restart at the uh, uh, afternoon at one o'clock. Thank you. <laughs> okay, <please. clears throat> uh, Uh, hold on a minute, I want to check this monitor is all work. I don't know.
哦，对，我刚才找你练练习练手。等一下，慢点，我跟。找到人了吗？我我跟他们说啊，嗯，就看我我我在那里等，我在那里。嗯，没事，有我一个。可以可以，没问题。OK。OK。Okay, let's start the afternoon part. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> let's have a quick review about what I have, we have talked at the morning time. I remember that uh, uh, this morning we have an introduction of the model market. And uh, I introduced some scenarios of the model, model market. What is the difference between model market and the model hub? And what do we want to do with the model market, such as model learning, example learning, example selection, model search, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And then I introduced the concept and some basic algorithms of ensemble learning. So what do we, why do we want to do ensemble learning and the, the some basic uh, algorithms about uh, ensemble learning, such as um, the voting, different voting methods, uh, bagging, boosting, and the stacking. And then I introduced uh, another specific uh, research area in ensemble learning is the uh, ensemble selection problem. So, so the ensemble selection problem is that so you want to select a part of the whole ensemble. For example, you want to select 100 models so Ten models or one hundred models, and to make to get uh, high uh, accuracy and uh, less cost for this. And uh, uh, okay, so this in some selection we have some introduced the three types of methods: search-based, rank-based, and the clustering-based. And uh, for clustering-based, we introduced the concept of the diversity here. So then I introduced the six different types of the model similarity measurement uh, metrics, such as uh, uh, B, you know, pairwise, three types of pair to pair, pairwise diversity metrics, and uh, three types of non pairwise Okay, uh, then uh, after, this is what we have talked uh, in the morning time, uh, I think it is all. And after this, I want to talk about this, uh, um, can okay, you talk about ensemble selection problem? And these are two papers that is state to art uh, till now, 2022, uh, about uh, how you do the ensemble selection problem when you can have the access to the local data set and uh, um, you, you want to use the diversity as a metric to do the clustering. Okay, the first paper is this boosting deep ensemble performance with hierarchical peony. And this paper is uh, published by uh, ICDM and uh, author is Liu Lian, uh, Prof. Liu Lian from Geotech and he, his PhD, uh, her PhD student. Okay, so. Uh, the motivation of this paper is that deep ensembles with high diversity are expected to be more failure independent, which can be critical for improving the overall ensemble accuracy and the robustness. So for the, that is to say the more diverse ensemble set is, the more accurate it, it will be. This is a conclusion we introduced uh, this, this morning. And also, given a deep ensemble of the large size such as 10. So also when you mentioned, you can see the here, this size the large size is 10, but actually in many more uh, real scenarios, this size 
can be huge more than 10. For example, 100 or 1000 always is possible. So, uh, but this size, this large size is 10. 10. What do we say? Sorry, I want to try why this is keep like this. Show down. I don't know. I don't know if I can keep it. Okay, so why this size 10 is large, uh, large size? I just repeat here again. For example, you have 10 models, one, two, uh, uh, zero to nine, yes. And uh, an example can be one, uh, zero, one, zero, two, zero, nine, yeah. And zero, one, uh, and until, I see, eight, nine, if, if the size, equals to two. And if the size is equal to three, you can have one, zero, two, one, zero, three, uh, et cetera. And then uh, the, the, the last one is one, two, three, four, and two, nine. So if you select them all. So how many ensemble combinations for a large size that 10 have? You can see it's like this problem. You can have 10 models and either you select this model, either you don't select this model. So it has, it has, it has, we have two to the power of 10 times, but, but you should, you should uh, delete 10 times because uh, a single model is not an ensemble. So only, only zero, only one is not an ensemble. So you, in total, you have this uh, size of ensemble selection, uh, ensembles, so for size of 10. So we can see that so if you have 100 models, you will have 100, uh, two to the 100, power 100 minus 100. So you have all this uh, amount of the ensemble select. So it's very hard, but 100 is just a, um, a, a small number of models in five linear scenario. So you can see it's an NP hard one uh, problem. So it means that it's a NP hard problem. Uh, it means you cannot just uh, um, select all the ensembles and uh, uh, to select the best one because you cannot try all the exponential uh, exponentially uh, size of this ensemble. Okay, so this is why we want to do the ensemble selection. I repeat it again. So based on this paper, so for a uh, large size as ten, it's often possible and beneficial to find the significantly significantly smaller deep ensembles, for example, three or four models with the same or better classification in general the ability as that of the entire deep ensemble. Uh, so they want to find the spot for the sign more, uh, for example, three or four ensemble size. Okay. And uh, here is this paper's objective. So we have 10 models here. And we have, we just mentioned, we have 1,013 uh, ensemble groups. So the baseline ensemble groups is one, zero to nine. So this is all selection, you select them all. And uh, this selection can get an accuracy of the 96.33%. Uh, uh, this, this is a basic accuracy. And uh, the base models are the same as the CVPR paper. As this CVPR paper, I will introduce later because this CVPR paper is uh, uh, SOTA paper for the ensemble selection problem. Okay, so the objective of this paper is to find the ensemble groups with less model inside. So this less model is means is in total is less than 10 models. Okay, so here is a table. Uh, this table one is means the ensemble deep ensembles for CFR10 and Emily You can see if you have an ensemble team of 0, 1, 2, 9, and the, this ensemble accuracy is this uh, 96.33 uh, percent, and the accuracy improvement is based on uh, this one. So, so the accuracy improvement based uh, compared with itself, of course, it is zero. And the team says it's ten. The cost is one hundred percent. So this cost is that when you give a new test ensemble, you need to test 10 times here. Okay, so this is the cost is 100%. Uh, so then you can see for CFR 10 here, and uh, this new ensemble team, 0, 1, 2, 3, and this ensemble accuracy is 
uh, percent, uh, less than point one five percent. So we can say that the ensemble team is less, and the ensemble accuracy is higher than the whole all selection ensemble size, and the accuracy impro improvement uh, can is zero point eighty five uh, eighty two percent, and the team size is small, so the cost is only forty percent compared to one hundred percent. Okay, so the last is the same. So they conducted this experiment to show that uh, the small ensemble can have a lower cost and can have sometimes can, can have a accuracy improvement. So it is worth, uh, worth doing the ensemble selection problem. Okay, so this is the objective of this paper to find the ensemble groups with less model inside. Okay? And uh, of course, uh, if they want to propose um, propose their own method. Uh, they want to. They need to uh, propose the existing works. So such as this, what is the baseline method? So the first uh, point is that they compute the mean diversity threshold. So the mean diversity threshold is remember this diversity. The diversity we introduced in the morning that uh, we have six different kind of diversity metrics such as BD, such as Cohen's Kappa, Blessy Kappa, Q statistics, mm -hmm. and then they, they compute the mean diversity threshold. So, uh, so I will give a detailed algorithm um, introduction about this. And this, uh, the second step is that we select the, uh, those, ense those ensembles in ensemble, and even I said they name this ensemble set as in I said with their diversity score uh, below the threshold. So this set means the high ensemble diversity so this means the good ensemble set here and place them into the good deep ensemble set. And the remaining ensembles with uh, their diversity scores higher than the threshold, for example, the low ensemble diversity will be pruned out. So this is a baseline you can say. Uh, that is to say, you can see this picture here and uh, the baseline method is just that they remove all the ensemble groups whose diversities are bigger than the average in diversity. Uh, Oh no, I, I don't think it's big. Uh, diversity is lower. It's a lower. Okay. okay. Diversity is lower because the high diversity means high accuracy. So you need, need to remove the uh, low diversity in some of side. For example, here, you can see there's a black line here. And then we just remove all these dots, remove all this, keep here. So this is a very simple and uh, basic method to. Uh, based on. But you should notice inside this method, they compare, so because their size is 10, you know, their size is 10, so they have in total 1,013 sample teams. So under this consideration, uh, under this uh, settings, they can test all 1,000 sample groups. But we should know if the KM is larger than 10, for example, if m equals 100, you will have uh, two to the power of 1,000 minus 100 to this kind of, so you cannot use their method to do the ensemble selection because this ensemble group size is too large. You cannot go through all the considerations, all the conditions. But you know, we should know under m equals 10, so you have 1,000, 1,000, this kind, so every, dot, every line, every dot here, is uh is a model is an ensemble team here okay so they can you can do this and to pull out how to pull out the baseline we can say hey, we just pull out uh, so uh every every ensemble team that uh, is lower than a specific threshold they just uh, pull this out and they keep this good part so this is the baseline method and. Uh, Indicators for this good ensemble set is just that we mentioned is this part of the models. This part of the model is put in this good ensemble set. So the ensemble accuracy range, what is the ensemble accuracy range? Is that uh, from here to here is the lowest uh, and the biggest uh, max. This is the range, okay, R and H. Uh, and what is the precision? So precision is the ratio of the number of selected ensembles whose Ensemble accuracy is equal to or higher than the accuracy of the given entire ensemble. Find the target accuracy, which is uh, 96.33% for the ensemble team or 10 models on set ten. Over the total number, over the total number of all selected um, ensembles. So for example, we have, for example, if this all selected ensemble is 200 models and the precision is 
quantum models between the accuracy, so whose ensemble accuracy is equal to or uh, higher than the accuracy of the given entire ensemble. Entire is at one, two, one, two, three. Dun, dun, dun. So if this higher, for example, if this part of this part of this, uh, this part of the models uh, is accuracy is higher than uh, 96.37%. Uh, for example, we have 40, uh, 50 points. So this is a precision. Precision. Okay, very defined. Okay, so this is a precision. And recall is the ratio of the number of selected ensembles in good ensemble set over the total number of the candidate ensemble set in ensemble set whose ensemble accuracy are equal or higher than the target accuracy of the entire ensemble. So we can just understand then what it does this mean. Uh, okay, we can see. So here, this part uh, is the models inside the good ensemble site, and uh, this part is the models not in the good ensemble site. But uh, maybe inside this, uh, this not uh, this this models not in the good ensemble, site, they may have some models that is better than oh one two three to now better than this uh, ninety six percent of accuracy. So we need to count how many models. So for example, we can have this part uh, and this part, uh, these two parts uh, together. So these two circles, uh, this inside, these three data points, these models uh, have better accuracy uh, than, the, than this one. And it's, it's not, 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 oh, this is accuracy, so we need to left, you know, because the baseline is cut down the, cut down the left one. Yeah, this is the diversity. Sorry, I missed miss us that. Yeah, so you need to cut down this, the left, uh, uh, the for example, the right part uh, and uh, keep the left part, uh, left part diversity. Um, oh, uh, cut out this and keep this. Okay. So this black line is not a diversity. This black line is a is a baseline is a ninety six percent upon thirty six percent. Okay. So the recall. Uh, we just mentioned that is maybe we have some models here. For example, is fifty, and some models here. For example, is thirty, and uh, uh, in total eighty. 80 models of this 1,000 models is better than uh, high, oh, no, not here, here, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, here, uh, here, okay, here, okay. Uh, it's better than this 96%, uh, and then you, you need to calculate the recall is 50 divided by 30 plus 50. This is the recall, okay? So this, this is correct now. Okay. Uh, so the cost is a reduction of the ensemble size against the entire uh, ensemble size. It's very easy. In total, you have 10 models and you select uh, three models and these three models, the cost will be, originally is 100%, now the cost is degraded to 30%. Okay, it's very easy to understand. So the problem of the baseline is that uh, low precision required accuracy range. So baseline, so this baseline method, you can see this figure. It has low precision, low recall, and low accuracy range. You can see this. No matter what kind of, uh, no matter what kind of the, no, not F, F is their method. Right? So this one, this one, so this one, and this one, these two are the baseline methods. And the accuracy range, you can see it's less than this, less than this, less than their method. Okay. So this is what we want to say about the baseline method. What's wrong with the baseline, baseline method? And the findings in, uh, in the research is that uh, if we directly use this CK equals half kappa BD binary disagreement uh, GD, the general disagreement uh, all this part is not good enough. The reason is that they are originally designed for comparing samples instead of selecting samples. Uh, so therefore, they tend to fail when they used uh, to select a high quality small size ensembles defined by ensemble accuracy and ensemble execution efficiency with respect to runtime and space cost of the ensemble execution. Therefore, we need to design a new diversity measure matrix. They mean this focal model based to select the good ensembles. So what is this focal diversity mean? Uh, the focal diversity aims to more accurately uh, capture the failure independence based uh, diversity of ensemble S member models of classification. 
so given an ensemble size uh, uh, or size s, we use each of the s member models as a focal model to collect the negative symbols and compute the focal model based on uh, the diagnostic score. And the conventional approaches is that we randomly draw negative symbols from any one or more models negative symbol set here. We, we remember what is ne negative symbol set. So for example, if you want to classify a uh, data set is dog uh, and uh, not a dog, not dog, not, not dog. So this dog is a possible symbol set and, then, and uh, the pictures or the images that is not a dog is a negative symbol set. For evaluating an ensemble of S member models. So this is a uh, um, conventional approaches, but the zero approach is this, our approach is randomly select uh, negative uh, symbols from a specific focal model. You remember this, this there was a one before, so it's a focal model here. So focal model, what is focal model? I will, uh, I will introduce later. So uh, you can use this symbol to represent this uh, negative symbol set uh, FF, and then calculate the focal model based on the diagnostic score. And for an ensemble of S models, in total S models, we will have S focal model based uh, diversity scores corresponding to this uh, ensemble. We can then combine this S focal diversity scores by taking the average as the final focal diversity score of this ensemble size S. So in the context of the adversarial robustness with uh, ensemble defense, our focal diversity message, uh, matrix can be viewed as taking the victim model or the attack target model as a focal model for evaluating failure independence of the different ensemble using negative symbols. Uh, this <laughs> this whole paragraph is just just to say that before they propose this focal diversity is uh, from this uh, no negative symbols they just used to to do the adversarial robustness of the defense in some of this. But now they just uh, transfer this concept to this new concept of focal diversity to ensemble selection problem. Okay, so findings with uh, focal diversity is that uh, they want to prove uh, using with this using new focal diversity, uh, it means high GDF, this value here, it, it will call the low ensemble accuracy. It means that uh, uh, if your diversity is very low, then your accuracy will be very low. You can say it's the diversity and the accuracy. And then you will have this more like a linear combination. Yes. Okay, so the reason for this conclusion is that the models in low diversity ensemble tend to have high fault dependency. That is to say they are very similar. So if one model fails, the other model which are similar to it are more likely to fail. This concept I just mentioned uh, in the morning. That for example, if you a whole ensemble is all A, so if this one fails, so because uh, the other two are the same model as A, so they will also fail. So the more similar these three models are, the more failure they will cost. Yeah. And uh, this table three is that the pure ensembles by mean threshold of CFR10. You can see that uh, if you use this focal diversity instead of the original diversity baseline, it, have, it already has some improvement uh, by the, for the accuracy range, for the precision, and for the recall here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then with focal uh, diversity metrics, the baseline method can have improvement. Uh, so, they said that even if we just uh, apply focal diversity here, not to up, modify any baseline method, it can still have any many improvement. But, uh, but uh, so if we stop here, it's not a good paper because we want to propose our own method to, uh, not our own method, their own method to uh, conduct the sample selection uh, process, especially we want to reduce the selection time. So in order to get high accuracy more quickly and to save more time, how to do this? So we can see given a focal diversity matrix, we first saw the ensemble so small size S, say for example S, X2, 2. And by their focal diversity scores in a decreasing order, and then they choose the top beta. It's a percentage of the ensemble so size S with, with larger 
diversity scores as our POE targets for examples of sizes. So the hierarchical POE algorithm will cut off the branches of the ensemble that are supersized of this removed ensemble. For example, all ensembles containing F5 and F6. So this process, you can see this figure is very easy. So for example, if we, we found that uh, uh, we we start with one model here, so F zero to F nine, and then we found that uh, uh F five, so F five is has low diversity. Uh, it's it's actually it's not good, so we just uh, cut down F five. Also, we cut down all the models, all the ensemble teams contains model F five. So in, for example, we cut down F five. We cut on F5, F0, F5, F1, F2. So all the ensemble teams that contain this F5 will be cut down. So this is a pure order. And also for the second step, uh, we find that uh, based on this, all this, uh, uh, except this, uh, all this existing ensemble teams, we do the same thing that uh, if we found F5, F7, is, uh, uh, F5 actually is already, uh, deleted, but F0 is not, but you, you can say you can just uh, iteratively delete all the information, uh, contains this, uh, contains this uh, information, uh, contains this in some team kind of here. So if you cut down F0, F5. Mm. So this is a hierarchical POE algorithm. Finally, an uh, ensemble size is added to the final SD selection if it is selected by at least three focal diversity metrics where hierarchical POE. This is a basic idea of this uh, hierarchical POE. Uh, experiments and conclusions is that we can see. First, uh, if S equals to three, we can POE 35 out of 120. If F equals to four, uh, we can POE 124 out of 210, and also this. And also the different sum of size three, two, uh, three, four, five, uh, three, four, ten. And uh, we set this parameter here. And uh, we can see this accuracy and the diversity that uh, this uh, black lines are the lines we just uh, pure out. And uh, this uh, this black line we remember is the baseline. Baseline. So we will select those zero, one, two. Now this uh, baseline accuracy. Okay, so we can see we can see that uh, for deep ensembles for this pure algorithms, most of the most of the ensemble teams are deleted. So, and this in terms, this ensemble team, their accuracy is lower than the baselines. Okay. So it, it, this proves that it, it is a, really works. Okay. So experiments and conclusions. Uh, for another part of the experiment is that we can see the impact of the beta on precision recall. Uh, so as we can see, as beta increased, uh, uh, we can see, here is the precision. Precision is gradually uh, increased uh, for MG9 and for CIFAR 10. And also for the recall, it will be gradually cut down to see that the beta is very good. Uh, sign. So as beta increases, the pure and precision increases when the recall decreases for the pure and the deep, deep ensemble, so both data sets. We choose beta, this choose beta equals to 20% to achieve the pure and the efforts and measured by this uh, eighty-one percent of precision and uh, fifty-two percent uh, of recall. Okay, so uh, the hierarchical pure algorithm performs very well with uh, all four focal diversity pure methods, achieving over eighty-five precision, identifying smaller ensembles of the same or higher ensemble accuracy than the entire ensemble. So the diversity consensus voting based on focal diversity pure is denoted as MAGF maintains at the 100% of precision. You can see what is MAGF? As you can see, this is one focal diversity with uh, CK, so components kappa, focal diversity with uh, binary disagreement, uh, KWGD, and this MAG. So consensus, this diversity also consensus, consensus with this address. And uh, this table file is that. Uh, also another same table, so, so, so you can see that uh, if you use this focal diversity and you use these three types of the, uh, of the uh, not three types, oh, four types. Four types of them together, you will get a higher precision or higher recall. So it's 
Yes, of but uh, you, this is the first paper published on ICDM. Um, I will introduce another sample selection paper also proposed by Liu Ling, Liu Ling's team from Biotech, and also similar idea, I think. Um, but uh, I will. I want to ensure that uh, till now, do anyone else have some questions about this paper? This healthy clustering. Uh, I will give you two minutes, and I will start uh, to to turn to introduce the next paper. Okay, and let's start. So, uh, that paper is used the uh, hierarchical pruning to do the ensemble selection. This new paper is uh, more not so type paper for CVPR. Uh, 2021 is boosting ensemble accuracy by revisiting ensemble diverse metrics. And uh, here, before I introduce this paper, we need to have some basic uh, views about this basic uh, basic models. So they use 10 models here. So just like the last, oh, uh, I need to use this presentation mode, sorry. Okay. So before I mentioned the last paper is also used the same 10 models, model zero to nine. And uh, the 10 models are this night uh, to rest night and accuracy is the local accuracy here is this for CIFAR 10 and for every night is another. Okay, so uh, this mean, means that uh, what is the minimum accuracy get by these all 10 models? You can see is this one, rest night 20. And the max is just net 190, this 60, uh, 96.68. Okay, so this is a base pool, model pools. And the question is here, so how to select the good ensemble teams from in total of the 1,013 teams when I make it to 10? And uh, okay, so the motivation is the same as the last paper. I, I don't want to uh, mention too much. And the negative symbol set is just the same we mentioned. It's a small set of negative symbols, randomly symbol from the set of negative symbols of the best model pool. And the Q diversity threshold is a mean value of all diversity values computed for all candidate ensemble teams in ensemble set. So this baseline method I just mentioned is the same as the last people. So I will skip this part. You just use the threshold, uh, you calculate the diversity based on this diversity matrix and you cut down some basic method. So you can see this is the diversity. You cut down the low diversity one and you keep on this one. This is the baseline method. And um, uh, remember here, here is a black line, and the blue line. What does this mean? This means this is uh, uh, the black line, I, I think, uh, uh, is uh, just uh, the total ensemble. Uh, the, the blue line is uh, the all selection, and the, the black line is the lowest. Uh, ensemble teams. It's not effective for selecting good ensembles from the 1,000 uh, candidate terms for two reasons. Well, the first reason is there is no clear correlation between ensemble diversity and ensemble accuracy among those selected ensembles in good ensemble set, which have diversity scores below the mean threshold. And um, among this, uh, those remaining ensemble teams that are discarded, some ensemble teams with high QGD diversity scores also have high ensemble accuracy. Well, no, here I x five and I make it to ten because this is just the similar like the last paper. So we need to claim the new method because you can see from this figure, this figure we want to show that uh, a line that if this is diversity and this is accuracy, and we we want to show that the more diversity, the more accuracy, or or the more General diversity, the micro, the lower uh, accuracy. Yeah. Okay. We want to show this relationship, but of course you can see from this figure that it is not, it is not that uh, apparent. So not obvious about this this pattern. But if you use this their new method, this is clear linear correlation of the general diversity and accuracy. You can see if you if. They, you use their proposed new idea. You can see a very clear linear uh, relationship between this generally generalized diversity and accuracy. So, uh, okay, 
So I misunderstand <laughs> okay, because they said this generalized diversity here. This value more high. So this value higher means that the uh, general diversity is lower. So it's, it's just the reverse. So here means that the, the higher this diversity, this generalized diversity, the lower the accuracy should be. Okay, should be here. So you can see a line here and the, the, the problem here is very good. Uh, so this is the figure. So I just uh, told you the conclusion that they proved using their algorithms, they can get this conclusion. And uh, how they do this? So how, how they do this? Of course, they, have, they use the focal diversity again. The first is the equal size ensemble. So given the total of the M-based models in the base model pool, we further divide the candidate ensemble team set and ensemble set to M minus one partitions. Each consists of ensemble teams of equal size S denotes by ensemble set S. So S is the low main, main minimum value is two and the maximum is M. So given M equals to 10, we will have in total 1,013 candidate ensembles in ensemble side and a total of 252 ensembles in ensemble side for S equals five. So uh, this concept I repeat again, for S equals five, we have one, two, three, five, one, two, three, six, uh, until uh, six, seven, eight, three, nine. So, so it started, it's not one, it is a single model, it's a 10. So in total, 252 ensemble teams. So the second step is we select the model as a focal model. We introduce the concept of the focal model, say F focal, and use negative symbols from the focal model to compute the FQ diversity scores for all ensemble teams of the fixed size S, which have the same M focal as a member. Denoted by ensemble set F focal S, recall figure two here with focal equals one, S equals five, the total number of the ensemble teams in seven will be uh, 100, 126. So what, what, what does this mean? Like? You don't need to say if you go to So if, we, sorry, uh, if uh, M equals to 10 and uh, S, uh, S equals to 10, two to 10. So if focal model is the first model, then we have one, two, three, one, two, three, five, one, two, three, six into uh, one because the focal module must uh, have one included and one seven eight nine ten yeah in total one hundred and twenty six um, uh ensemble teams and if the focal model is the second model we have two three four five one two three four and this is not two la this is three uh two six I uh, guess because two already included and uh, two seven eight nine ten yeah and in total one hundred and uh, uh, 26 uh, ensemble team. So you know, we need to, uh, for example, if S D five S equals five, we need to fix one model. For example, fix the, the fifth model, and then the other four is the other. We run as you select uh, four models among the nine models. It's like uh, select nine four models. It's all like this. Uh, in total, uh, 126 all these kind of teams. Uh, so this is the second step is I select the model as a focal model. The third step is focal model based uh, ensemble selection. How to do this is at first I initialize DAQ uh, this this uh, array as input A and then for I equals one to ensemble set focal model as we can do that. So we calculate this QI is a diversity metric Q on TI neck. You know, how to do this? This TI is a classifier as Q is, um, just uh, the whole ensemble teams and the negative symbol set uh, is that uh, the set uh, symbol uh, with this focal model. And the accuracy is just uh, we calculate this uh, classifier test accuracy. And here, here we, we get uh, diversity, we get accuracy, and we combine this as a tuple, and we append uh, this tuple to this input, to this set and this set. Yeah. Okay, so accuracy here, the accuracy get by the negative symbols. And uh, then after this, for every S cluster by k means with k equals two, two centroids from the left top, uh, left top and the uh, right top. Here, here, and here, you can see. This two point one is the left top and second is the right bottom. So the red dots are cluster one here, uh, cluster one. And the second dots, it's just the two. Okay. 
the red uh, vertical line is the FQ diversity threshold, and we can put all the dots at the left into the good ensemble set and focal SQ. So what what does this mean? Uh? So you can see the red vertical line here is a uh, is uh, the FQ diversity threshold. We can put all the dots on the left here, including some black black dot here to this good ensemble set. And uh, how to compute this FQ diversity threshold? Uh, how, how to compute this red line? We can say this red line is the minimum value of the mean DAQ and the mean, uh, mean uh, this is all, all mean, mean DIV cluster two and mean DAQ, well, which does mean. So we can have this is cluster two. We calculate the mean value here. And then uh, we calculate the whole ensemble set here. Oh, no, 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 this mean, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, this, this mean, this, you can have this, 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 this point, yeah, this point. And uh, this mean, this mean is this, um, maybe this point. And we compare these two points and to see which one is uh, smaller. And we select this smaller here as a threshold here, okay, threshold here. So this is what we calculated with this red line. So we after we calculated this threshold length, we just uh, keep all these part of verticals and uh, we cut out all these slides, all these points. And uh, this figure is the whole algorithm I mentioned. So just uh, like I just uh, combined the above steps, I will not mention it, you can see the details. Uh, so the the fourth step is the combining different uh, focal models, because you know for f equals ten s from two to ten the focal from one to ten we have ninety sides of good ensemble. So the set of f focal s q and we have ninety different set of f q score, but different uh, f q score. So because we have ninety, so we have ninety sides. So they. We need to unification all this of the set. Otherwise, uh, we cannot compare them directly. So how to do this? So the D bar is equals to, we just use the mean max scalar. scalar. We, we, we can say it's a very simple idea. And we need to unify all this, F, all this FQ score to put all teams together. So here they use this ensemble set unify FQ is that we combine all these good ensemble sites uh, uh, from focal from zero to m minus one to denote the set of selected ensemble teams we set as each with the unifying FQGD score. You can see this figure. So this is ensemble set one, ensemble set two, ensemble set S, and you calculate the different FQ scores and put this as, as the unifying FQ. So then after we do this, we have, we have got, got another figure. So see this, and then we apply chemist again with similar method to peel on another part of bad teams. So here's the red points is a good team here, and uh, the black points are bad team and bad because they apply chemist and they calculate the threshold with similar ideas. I will not repeat again. And uh, for this FQGD, FQKW, and these yellow points are the points we we already removed by the sort of uh, steps. And this black is we remove the at this step and this red lines are we keep the, the, at this point. Okay. So then we combine all teams from S equals to two to M. Uh, so to get the final good ensemble site. But it's, it is still not over. So it is for one, for example, it's for one diversity matrix, is another diversity matrix. And uh, how to do this? Uh, the last step is the use the FQ fusion based ensemble selection, EQ. So it means easier is an uh, ensemble selection. Okay. And then how to do this is different FQ diversity matrix may select a different ensemble teams. So the final good teams are the intersection of the top three FQ matrix. So the formula is very easy. You just take a uni here, here yeah, you take a union of these all three types of the good ensemble set. And uh, for example, here you can see uh, we have six different types of the methods here, and uh, uh, we need to select the best three here, here, here. These three because they have the top three accuracy in some methods here. So we need to 
we need to select uh, the ensemble team screen, this one, this one, and this one, and uh, we take the intersection, you know, intersection of the three to. So it uh, con conducts the final EQ teams. So this is a good ensemble FQ, so final EQ teams. And this EQ teams can get an accuracy of the 96.40, this accuracy is higher than the above. So this is the final ensemble teams we want to keep in the end. Okay. So this is what they conduct uh, to select a good ensemble teams inside the ones uh, inside of our ones on uh, thirteen teams. And uh, let's see some experiment results. So we can see so for the EQ methods, we can see the ensemble accuracy range, ensemble accuracy range, and uh, um, and other parameters are always the best. And uh, now this is, is the accuracy above. So we can see this and uh, some accuracy and some max uh, is always the best. Uh, always better than the baseline uh, and always better. And uh, this is the 10 examples of good ensemble teams identified by their metrics on ImageNet. For example, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 8, 9, and then ensemble accuracy here, highest the member accuracy, highest the member model, and highest the improvement is the uh, yeah, experiment. I will skip this part. You can see the biggest uh, see the paper later if you are interested. So the conclusion of this paper is that the first is the ensemble team selected by all FQ or EQ diversity metrics provided a high ensemble accuracy, lower bound of the uh, 94.4%, which is a significant improvement over the average accuracy of 94.25% uh, of the 10 base models and also over the lower bound of the 93.46% of the using the corresponding Q diversity matrix. The second is that the FQ diversity based ensemble selection can select the high quality ensemble teams well, pure out low quality ensemble teams. The third is that the EQ diversity method can leverage FQ diversity fusion to further improve the quality of the ensemble selection compared to FQ metrics, further boosting the overall ensemble accuracy of the uh, selected uh, ensemble teams by pure out of these ensembles that are not in the intersection of the selected teams by the top three FQ metrics. So this is, paper is now the SOTA method uh, published on CVPR 2021 to see how we select the good ensemble teams. But we should know that this method is not very applicable to more models because this says that M, M, M equals 10 is a large size, but it's not the large size in most of the scenarios. If M 100 or 1000, you only have 100 or 1000 and minus one, all this can tell you cannot just Go through all the ensemble teams and to to do the class to do the chemist clustering or something. So I think this method has a lot of constrictions and uh, it should not be applicable to many applied uh, scenarios. But uh, this is also another way to do ensemble selection. So this is two uh, two papers uh, introduced by um, Prof Liu Lin and his students about the first author of these two papers uh, from Geotech. And uh, do you have any questions? I will wait for two minutes to 2.30. Okay. Hey, you are in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. So uh, this is a third uh, topics about uh, uh, in some more selection um, problems and I introduced the, all the diversity metrics and all the um, introduction matrix uh, and the two papers about ensemble selections. So we, now we start our last uh, section about this model search by data set. It's another topic in model market. So what is this topic means? I will open this now. Uh, before we, before we introduce this topic, uh, we need to uh, first uh, to introduce the concept of the transfer learning. So what is the transfer learning? Transfer learning, it has contains two types of transfer learning traditionally. One is fine tune, and the second is head chain. Fine tune will train the base layers together with the last dense layer, and the head chain is all, can only train the last head chain, head layer. So we can see we have an image here, and we have an image here. 
uh, it's a cat and another is a dog and these are base layers. And the probability for cat and the probability for dog is the two data point. So first, uh, before we have a, a model stru structure here and we cut down the last layer and we replace the last dense layer to a new node here. And uh, before we want this uh, model to predict for cat, to classify cats. And now we want uh, the layer to the model, whole model to classify dogs. So how do we do this? We can just uh, cut down the last layer and uh, replace it with a new layer and train the last new layer. Uh, it's a way. And also we can train the previous, the, the first uh, minus one layers together with the last layer. It means the function. So if you only train the last layer, it needs a head train. Okay. So uh, this is what I mean high head training and the fine tune. High training is the left and fine tune is the right. Different the train trainable parameters. We can say hey the carous layer is a global polling 2D the dense. And for the left one is a head training. You can see uh, it has in total uh, 70, uh, I, I think 76,900 uh, parameters. And uh, your, the trainable parameters is this one. And the total parameters is 5 million, 5.8 million. So the non trainable is this one. So it means you can only train the last dense layer. And uh, the second uh, model is this one. These two model together, okay. The trainable models is you, you can add these two together, but uh, it's still not uh, the the total model parameters because some parameters cannot be trained, such as uh, uh, batch normalization, such as the dropout. Uh, these parameters cannot be trained. So the trainable parameters are this one, and the non-trainable is still has uh, almost a thirty thousand here. Okay, so this is a basic concept of the transfer learning and uh, what is the concept of high training and fine tune. And the motivation of this uh, topic is that uh, when a user upload a data set, we want to have them to find the suitable models from the model market, which after fine tune or high training on the training data set, we will have good test accuracy for the test set user. For the test data, uh, this test data is the data user doesn't upload. This is the motivation. And uh, here is a general framework about uh, this model, uh, model search by data set problem. First, uh, we know that uh, the, we need to train our models based on our local data set here. Okay. Then the model providers will upload their models to the model markets uh, here in the restricted pool. And then we propose uh, idea about uh, how to select a good ensemble team, uh, not good ensemble, sorry, uh, how to select a good model that uh, you after training on the local data side, you uh, bias the local data side, you can get a good training. So you can see here, uh, user has, uh, here, user has its own data set, and uh, this, uh, after you select these high models, these models, these models, they can, can have a high accuracy, fine tuning return models. So the models are trained upstream for various architectural data sets. Models are restricted into a pool and ranked by a search strategy here, yeah? search strategy, rank. We need to do the ranking. And a subset of the models based on the ranking are pre fine tuned, fine tuned on users' data set in a downstream process. So here. So this is, uh, uh, so I, let me repeat the whole general framework. The first step is that uh, the model providers train their models on their local with on their local data set, and then they upload their models to our model market, and then uh, uh, and buyer, buyer, model buyer, they want to upload a small set of their data set to our model market, and we will search, we will do the search, we will do the search, and we search some models inside this model market, and we do a ranking and uh, we provide uh, the suggestions models to him. And then after we 
suggest uh, after we provide this suggested uh, models to users, users can download these models uh, on their local machines and they train with their local data set and uh, this uh, new models can get a very high accuracy, very, 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 um, very good performance. So this is a ranking method. Yes. Okay. So we need to ensure that the suggested model, provided model, model here is better than this not provided model here. Yes. So this is what we want to do. Okay. So the a subset of the models based on the ranking are fine tuned or uses that set in downstream design. Um, this problem is tricky. Well, why is tricky? Because we have an upper bound already. What is the upper bound is that the brute force fine tune all models in the model market with the uploaded the upside data set and find the top K models by their validation accuracy. This way can always get the best models you reckon because you try them all. You can see, for example, you have 10 models. You have 10 models, you just try the, you just test the uploaded data set for model one, by model one, model two, to model 10, and then you find which one the local validation accuracy is the best and you select them. But uh, this upper bound selection method uh, is very time consuming. We, you, you need to cost a lot of time. For example, our market, we have 1K, 1K models. You need to test the 1K times on this uploaded data set. But it will cost a huge amount of time. So, can we just uh, do another thing? Is how to search models by data set efficiently and the recommended models will have similar test accuracy as the brute force upper bound method on users test side after they perform the fine tune on these models. So this is the problem. So we don't want to fine tune them all and to uh, and to see well, which one is the best. We want to don't do the fine tune and we want to use some similar or easy methods to try to find these models inside this problem. Okay, so this is the SOTA, uh, okay, let's see. So SOTA methods are the baselines about uh, this model efficient search strategies. And uh, I have, hello? Sir? Okay, this is a this is a GitHub or uh, repos that I make a conclusion about uh, what uh, now the model search paper or uh, contains papers about model search for future transfer learning fine tune. The problem is to filter and search between models before stepping the real fine tuning process to downstream target uh, task and data set. This is this two are largest, largest papers and these are benchmarks and these are existing works based on their categories. Okay. Uh, you can have a look. Uh, you can you can search Nibo online to my GitHub and uh, see this. And I have also have some other libraries such as uh, command line configure you can use if you want. It will help you reduce your code uh, amount. Yeah, for code lines. Okay, so the sort of baseline methods for this is that uh, uh, we have four types of the search method. The first uh, uh, is a task agnostic search. It's the ranking models trained on the image net based on the upstream accuracy. The second is meta learned uh, task agnostic search. So one could fine tune every model registered in the model yeah, on in the system on a fixed set, set of benchmark and use the aggregation metric used to rank the models chosen by the user. The third is task aware search using linear can classifier accuracies as a proxy to rank the models. Other measures like leap and H score, etc. All this. The, the last one is the meta learned task aware search is task to work, more to work. The goal is to favor models that perform well on benchmark data sets similar to the downstream one. So I will introduce these papers one by one, but uh, not uh, very detailed because 
the existing works are very high. I just want to mention the basic thoughts of how ideas of these papers and the basic experiments and to say if you are interested in this method and in this, this topic to do. Okay, the first is that to better emit net model transfer better. The fine tune is better than simple transfer learning. So this is the title of this paper. So the fine tune is better than simple transfer learning. Uh, the, 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 the first conclusion. The second is that the net performance of the pre-trained model is a critical fa factor in transfer performance. Uh, this, then the net coupon accuracy was highly correlated with true transfer accuracy. The, the ImageNet pre-training accelerates convergence and accuracy benefits of ImageNet pre-training fade quickly with data size. And ImageNet pre-training does not necessarily improve accuracy on fine-grained tasks. Why do we want this conclusion? Why do I want to introduce this paper? Is that uh, we want to prove that this topic is, is worth doing. So we can see that if you use ImageNet to so the models trained on Pre-trained on MNET, then you can transfer this model uh, to other tasks, and they prove that uh, you uh, different MNET models have different performance, and uh, you need you do need to do the selection, you do to the search problem or rank problem to do this. So this is why we want to do this uh, topic. And uh, okay, so this model, which model to transfer, is published the. Uh, um, conference uh, top layer and uh, this paper is to say which one is uh, which is the best paper. So the upper bound is that given no new limits on computation, the problem is trivial. So we can exhaustively fine tune each model and pick the best performing one. But, oh, uh, but I, I mean, they, they also concluded uh, all these types of the search methods, uh, okay? The first is task agnostic search is ranking models trained on MNET based on the upstream accuracy. The second is meta land task agnostic search. One could find you every model registered in the system or fix the size of benchmark and use the aggregation metric to use to rank the models chosen by the user. And uh, um, task aware search using linear KN classifier accuracy as a proxy to rank the models, other metrics as leap and score. Okay. The meta land task aware search is task to work, model to work. The goal is to favor models that perform well on benchmark data sets similar to the downstream one. Hybrid search selects the both top one task agnostic model and the top B minus one task aware models leads to strong overall results. And then this paper defines this budget and regret concepts that how to calculate the um, performance of this uh, accuracy uh, model search program. So you can see this is the expectation of the Oracle. And uh, it, it is that you select the maximum accuracy is of this, of all the models. And, and uh, you decide, uh, you, you, you just say, if you want to select uh, a small set of uh, so SM, and you want to, Calculate the expectation of this SM uh, of the max accuracies, and then you do the manners, and you can get this uh, real improvement of this method. Okay, this is an indicator to show that uh, uh, how well your model search problem problem is. Experiment conclusion. Okay, so. Uh, they have four, 15 models on MGNet, 16 on GFT, 15 on VTIP, and in total is 46 source models, 19 target and downstream tasks. And uh, the first is task agnostic strategies is not enough. So they have high regress, they pros. The second is that uh, there is no single strategy uniformly dominates all other strategies across both. The third is that hybrid linear strategy outperforms all individual strategies on all on the output. You can see. So this hybrid linear strategy is proposed by the authors. So uh, this is one method to calculate, uh, to do the model search problem. The second is the shift uh, paper. This paper is not published now, but uh, this this idea is I think is very okay. So this is an efficient, flexible search engine for transfer learning, and they use a successive halving. So start by uniformly allocating a fixed initial budget, for example, b divided by log to m to all m models, and then evaluating their performance, keep only the better half of the models, and repeat this into a single model. You don't need to 
look at this algorithm. So for example, you have 10 models, and the first, uh, and you have 100 symbols, 100 symbols, uh, okay, 100 symbols. And then the first uh, time you, you need to test uh, the first uh, 20 symbols on models one to 10, and to see which one uh, is best, which one is, is not best. And then you cut, you select half of them. So for example, if one, two, three, four, five is good, and you just discard the remaining six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So one, two, three, four. And then you use the next uh, 20 symbols to test the accuracy on one, two, three, four, five, and uh, to discuss and uh, discuss the uh, better ones such as two and five. And the next one is you test this three, and uh, you discuss the uh, final three. Uh, and then last, uh, you test the one four, uh, for example, and uh, then you can get the final models you want. So the final one the models you want to search. So this is a success, successive hardware method to do this. So there are two types of problems. Uh, with this model search problem in most of the papers. The first is a task transferability. How well a source task can be transferred to one or more task, uh, target tasks? For example, ImageNet trained models to CIFAR 100 and CIFAR 10, for example, all this kind of task. And the model selection is that how to select from several source models to get the top K best performing models on a single ta target task. So this task, uh, these two types of the Problems have some similarity, you can see. But it, it's all the same thing. So, the first is tra task transferability. I will introduce this task nomi um, paper. It's the paper published on CVPR 2018. And uh, then the model selection is how to select from several resource models to get the top K past uh, performing models on a single task. I will introduce it later. So the taxonomy is that it uh, attempts to model similarities between tasks by how well models transferring from one task to another perform after fine tuning. You can see this is task specific modeling is a time transfer uh, modeling is that, uh, so this is basically what they want to do. Like. But they also they have a same data set. So for example, they take some pictures uh, from the indoor scenes, uh, for example, the desks, uh, the tables, all these kind of things. And then we partition all these kind of data sets into different uh, uh, tasks. For example, we can we can use the similar we can use the same uh, pictures to do the image classification. Also we can do this 2D segmentation, 2D edits, autoencoding, 2D key points. And that means to say we use the same set of the pictures, but we, we can conduct uh, different uh, 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 tasks. So this is task nomi, okay? So different tasks. So we should know that this domain, this domain is the same. So all the tasks domain is the same because they all took from the indoor sense these pictures. And uh, this paper has some conclusion that all of these models taxonomic are trained on the same data with different labels and follow roughly the same structure, only varying the source and the target task. And the typical model selection works on taxonomy require network trained on the target data to suggest the transfers, which should be avoided to make transfer learning more accessible. And the following method is DDIS and Debra also has these limitations. So we should remember that we need to do the model, this network are trained on the target data set to suggest the transfers to be awarded to make this do this. Okay, so more detailed, more community method proposed by other methods such as Deborah. This Deborah, you can see this is a general framework for this paper. You have the proper data and you, you, you construct the DN here and you do the backward attributes, uh, attribution maps here and you extracting features, then you build a deep attribution graph. So in Debra, each node corresponds to a data point in probe data and its feature is the vectorized attribution map of this data point. So the edge between two nodes denotes the relatedness of the two data points and are measured by their similarity in the independent space of PRDM. So intuition is that the model focusing on similar regions of input images are expected to produce uh, correlated representations and thus potentially give rise to favorable transfer learning results. 
So for example, this figure two, you can see we have, this is the uh, tasks by uh, taxonomy we just mentioned. And this is the uh, graph generated by Deborah. Okay, here, yes. And this is the nodes we need to just predefine all these nodes. Yes, okay. All right. And the visualization of some examples, the nodes of the nodes and the edges of the approach. So for the nodes, we visualize three examples from taxonomy data in DOS and COCO respectively for the edges. We random some symbol 30 nodes from taxonomy data that show their interconnections. You know that some weak connections are omitted for better visualization. Here we select the two 3D tasks, three 2D tasks, two geometric tasks, and two semantic tasks for uh, visualization and the task similarity tree derived from task we depicted the above task names. Okay, so uh, the experiment is that, is that uh, there are 18 task models and uh, it's faster than task and have similar clustering results we can see here. Uh, this is a PR curve and uh, the PR curve and the task similarity tree obtained by pro data randomness and uh, symbols by task data here. Okay, it's good. Okay, this is uh, Depra, and then I will introduce Task Wack. This is published on ICCV 2019. Uh, the feature information here, mm. uh, I need to introduce the feature information first. What is the feature information and why we want to use the feature information to represent the model task? So if the classification performance of a given task does not depend strongly on parameters, the corresponding entrance on the FI, uh, this feature information will be small. I remember this, this this sentence. Why is that? I will explain. Otherwise, the small perturbation of this parameter will bring huge cost of the for the final results. So where h is cross entropy loss and the beta controls the weight of prior. Notice that for beta equals one, this reduces to uh, recalling. I don't don't do, don't do ignore this this sentence. Are you good? So this is a loss, and this is expectation for the cross entropy loss. And uh, we want this to be small. How to do this? Uh, why we need to use this feature information? We can see is that uh, if you, we just, uh, not all the network weights are equally important in predicting the task variable. So the, the importance of informative content of a weight for the task can be quantified by considering a, a perturbation, omega slash, equals the omega uh, plus delta omega of the width and the measurement, measuring the average in this KL divergence between the original output dimension distribution here and the part of the one here. The second order observation, this is this one, you can see. And where F is a fish information matrix and uh, F is this one, and that is a covariance of a scope gradient of a log length with respect to the model parameters. So we can see, so, if this parameter is very important, so if you just, you even if you add a very small amount of this omega, so to omega star, omega slash, then the perturbation, then the entropy, cross entropy will, will be very high. Yeah, so this is what we want to see where we will use the fish information. And then after that, we use sufficient information to represent the original data set. Understand? Yes. Uh, so after that, so how do we conduct the model search problem? You can see, because uh, we already have a map by the fish information, we can map the existing data set distribution to existing data to the with the fish information to existing space and then we come with the new data set the user uploaded and then the user uploaded the new data set to the fish information to the we also need to use this task to work uh, to calculate the fish information and to map to the new um uh, to a space such as this this class uh the Original points, uh, original points mapped by the model's original data set. And uh, for example, let me change the color. And then this one, uh, so I know this one is uh, a user's uploaded uh, data set. Uh, and then we map this to the same space. And to see which one is closer to the data set here, or here, or here. For example, this is the closest. So we will select uh, 
this model. So this this is a data set correspond to the model as the as the best models. So this is basically what, what this method want to want to say. Yeah. Okay, so this is a task to work. And then we will I will introduce about the model to work. What is model to work? So given k models, there are model to work in many other vectors of the mi equals to fi plus bi, where fi is a task in many of the tasks used to train model mi. If available, I also will set it to zero. And bi is a learned model bias that perturbs the task in many to account for particularities of the model. We learn bi by optimizing a KV cross entropy law to predict the best model given the task distance. And uh, we can see just like uh, we use this loss function to kind to minimize this. After training, given a novel query task T, we can then predict the best model for all eight uh, as the argument in this distance. And that is a model M I invented closely to the query task. So there are two methods of model selection with task to work or model to work. The first one is that we embedded the task and select the feature extractor trend on the most similar task I, I already said, said before. The second is that we can jointly embed the models and tasks and select the model using the learned matrix. Okay, so uh, in this mod, in this paper, they propose some uh, 140, 55, 56 feature vector trend on different tasks, and they propose the 50 target tasks with rest net 34. Okay, <laughs> let's see the experiment results here. So here is the task to work uh, uh, figure. It often selects the best available experts. There is a violin plot of the test oral distribution shaded on tasks from the COV200 data set obtained by training a linear classifier or several experts feature extractors. So most uh, specialized feature extractors perform similarity on a given task and a similar or worse than a generic feature extractor pre-trained pre on image net is blue triangles. However, in some cases, a carefully chosen expert uh, trained on related task can greatly outperform our other authors, our others finding the long lower uh, whiskers. So uh, the model selection algorithm based on task to work can predict an expert to use the uh, use for the task. The red cross lower is better and often recommend recommends the optimal or near optimal feature extractor without performing an expensive brute force training and evaluation over all available experts. So columns are ordered by norm of the task embedding vector and tasks with lower embedding norm have lower error and more complex task tasks with higher embedding norm tend to be benefited more from the specialized expert. It's just to see all this kind of data size and it can have a higher accuracy by this task to work. Okay, next uh, paper is LEAP. LEAP is a new measure to evaluate the transferability of learned uh, representations. It's ICML 2020. For instance, if theta is a model pre-trained on um, uh, image net uh, and uh, D is a CFR data set, then Theta X is a distribution of image net labels, which may not be semantically related to the true label of the X in the CFR uh, data set. So you can first calculate uh, this, these three formulas and then get the deep uh, values. Uh, what is this means? Uh, we, we should first see. So the larger values, so the small absolute values indicate better transferability. When the target task contains more class, the leaf scores will be uh, will be tend to be smaller. So this theta here is the original model's head to used to predict the original the probability of the original XI. So this is the uh, uh, this categorical distribution is the distribution of the original labels. So this step, we calculate this marginal um, uh, probability. It measures the uh, probability of the output from the original model and uh, also the task, uh, uh, the, the correlation between the original sum label probabilities of the task task. For example, if we have z equals to two and y equals to one, we need to find out to calculate uh, here. So p z equals to two and uh, based on z, z equals to two and y equals to one. It means that uh, if one original model, these things that input, input symbol should be classified as two, and uh, but the real 
label y value is one, this uh, how what is this uh, probability? So the higher this value, it means that the original models output the label z is more correlated with the real label y. Uh, so uh, z equals two, the marginal distribution is that uh, all the symbols uh, when when z equals to two is the the sum of the probabilities and you take the average in that. So this is what these four formulas means. So this is leap. And uh, let's see about this experimental results. The leap scores clearly correlate with the test accuracies with correlation coefficient higher than uh, 94% and uh, P is minus one, no, no, no. <laughs> this is, is this, the report, this is point, this is dot, not the uh, column mark, okay. In all cases, and uh, they, are, they have uh, nine source models and one, one target data set is say for 100. And the figure one is that the leap scores um, uh, with, uh, with this test accuracy of two transfer learning algorithm together with their best uh, the lines reported for transferred models on 200, 200 random tasks constructed from uh, CIFAR 100 data. Blue and orange points on a vertical uh, line correspond to the same target set. And the source models are the first is ResNet 18 pre trained on MainNet, and the second is ResNet 18 pre trained on CIFAR 10. Say you, you can see this. So it says the more leap score is, the more test accuracy is. It's just this conclusion. Okay, so this is leap, and then I will introduce another paper from my clear twenty twenty one. This means the scalable transfer learning with expert uh, models. So we can see this uh, figure. This figure uh, basically introduces the whole procedure of this method about model search. So you can see transfer learning with per task routine of experts. The well, first step is that a single baseline model B is trained on the entire upstream data set. Uh, step two is that the upstream data is divided by, in semantic subset, possibly overlapping. One expert is trained on each subset using the width from B as in initialization. And the third step is what we want to focus is that given a new downstream task DT and uh, uh, we compute the image representations MEXT from each expert E. We use KN to compute the accuracy on the supervised uh, problem DT equal to this and select the expert E star with the highest accuracy. And the last step is we add new new head E star and fine tune its whole network uh, within the downstream data leading to the final model. Uh, it, uh, it actually, it's very easy. Uh. So first you train these upstream classes and uh, you train the experts or something. And then you conduct a KN for these different experts and uh, you select the best uh, with the highest accuracy and uh, you, you use the best uh, expert to conduct on the downstream classes. So it's very easy. Uh. So overall, the performance proxy KN selection performs better than all other alternatives. They we tested on 19 data sets with four categories, natural, specialized structure, and all. So um, if you are interested, you can see what is these four types of the data sets. But you can see the we have one key results of different selection algorithms using for experts trained on GFT, the average accuracy across each group of tasks and across all we type is reported. In each data set, the median accuracy over 30 runs is used. The bootstrap the confidence interval is at 95% level are included. So you can see this is a baseline, no expert, uh, random expert domain, all these different kind of expert uh, level matching, performance accuracy, and this this uh, four types of the data sets here. And uh, also you can get the best performance, see, yeah. So the performance proxy can always get the best performance. Uh, not always, most of the cases. So next paper is a linearized framework and a new benchmark for model selection for fine tuning. It's uh, okay, no. So the linear model here, or what is the linear model I introduced here? So you can see for any of the model, for example, y equals to x square, and uh, we if we just uh, make the derivative of uh, we, so we took a very small part of this 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 section, and then we can see that uh, we can just uh, 
um, customizely to uh, this part uh, into a linear model, you can see. So, so just like this is a um, quadratic, uh, quadratic, uh, quadratic function, and then um, let's say, you can, oh, sorry, you can see we can just uh, under this small area, we can just use this y equals to 2x minus 1 to uh, represent this part of this small area. So this is a basic idea so, uh, of this linearized model. So we can do the differential. Uh, then after this concept, we can see that a linearized model is the original model plus this. This is the basic the, the function formula so for this. And uh, we use this LGC and FC score to do this the Pearson correlation coefficient between the interest of theta f and the interest of ky. It means that you can see SLG, this is just the, the, the Pearson correlation coefficient formula. So you calculate the theta f or you calculate the theta just by the interest of the ky. It's very easy to understand. Yeah. And uh, then we can look at this experimental settings. Well, in, in total, we have 30 models, the rest net 100, 0, uh, 101, this net 166, turn now 8 soft data set, and target set is 19 data set. And uh, this F, RFC score is a good proxy for ranking by Fantio accuracy, and it can allow us to select or reject the model for Fantio. Our label correlation and leap methods can select the best model in it. Uh, less than seven trials for our single domain uh, model group of uh, 30 experts. I can see this. Uh, it's basically the same experimental result to show that this method is okay. And uh, there also the RFC score is a good proxy for ranking by fine tuning accuracy and it can allow us to select or reject the models for fine tuning. Our label correlation and leap methods can select the best model in less than seven trials for our single domain rule of 30 experts. You can see this is a, for the other side, uh, this is a 20 shot. Okay, so maybe this is the last paper, I think. Uh, no, uh, no, the last paper. We have still have two papers. Okay, uh, I will first introduce this representation similarity analysis paper, it's RSA paper. The first thing that we select the final compressed output of this, uh, models of the representation for RSA. For, uh, if we want to use this RSA ping method, we need to first uh, calculate the two correlation. The first is the Pearson correlation, and second is the Spearman's correlation. For the Pearson correlation, we can see you, uh, this is the basic formula, and I will not uh, go details because you can check this is a concept. And uh, after you, you get these two correlations, the first step for you to do for RSA is that uh, uh, represent, representation, this, uh, this similarity may, matrix RDFs are generated by computing the pairwise dissimilarity, the one minus Pearson's correlation of each image pair on subset of selected images. And the B is that the next step is you can, the similarity score, you, you use the Spearman's correlation RS denoted with this uh, dot all of the low triangle Triangular RDM was the two models used as the similarity score. Here, DN1 and DN2 refer to models trained on task one and two, respectively. You can say you first, uh, for a single image, you go through these two different types of DN, and you get the last, uh, last layer's representation for M, and you calculate the uh, Pearson, uh, uh, one minus Pearson correlation of each image care on set. And to put it here, you can see this is the one image, the same image, and, and you can see this matrix. And this matrix, after that, so we have two different matrix here, here. Oh, the number this is was the same DN. Okay, so we then the second step is we compare these two two matrix the low triangle to calculate this similarity score to see if the similarity score is the same. So the more Higher score means that the more similar these two models are. Okay, our goal is that the, the first is to find the relationships between different deep learning models or tasks. The second is the test. <clears throat> we want to test if ranking using RSA depends on data set and model size. And so, for example, small data set models have similar performance as bigger ones. 
And the third uh, is like the transplanting by RSA or something kind of this. So this is a paper for goals for this paper. Okay, let's, let's see their upper, uh, approach. The first is the RSA or task specific pre trained DNA models from task nomi to compute the task similarity matrix. The second is the RSA or small model SDN trained on small data set and comparison of the task nomi pre trained models. The third step is that RSA or small model SDN trained on new task possible vehicle semantic segmentation with task nomi trained models. What do, do this mean? The first is that like we can see if we want to do the uh, I can see we have three goals. The first is find a relationship between different uh, models. So you can see, you can just uh, calculate the RSA and this is the relationships, their similarities. Okay, so you can get this task similarity matrix. The second goal is that uh, you test the ranking using RSA depending on data set and model size. So small data set model will have similar performance and bigger ones. So for, uh, for this, we have a small deep learning model, neural network model, and the deep learning neural network is a larger one. And then we calculate uh, their uh, RSA scores, and we can get this task similarity comparison, and we conclude it. We have some conclusion I'll explain later. And the third uh, is more related by uh, model search is transfer learning by RSA. Lab. So we can see that, so how can we just select uh, good models inside these pictures, inside these existing models? So we need to need, uh, first we need to get a new domain and then we random select some subject subsect uh, sub and we train a small model, small DNPV on this uh, particle VOC domain. And then this RSA 20 task nomi models from uh, so this, uh, then we compare this small model, compute this RSA with existing models in the model market. For example, the other 20 models here, okay, and to calculate the similarities. So it means that we have to first train a small model on the existing data side, on the provided data set, and, uh, 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 and, uh, and to compute the similarity between the small model and the existing bigger models to see which one is similar and to select the best, uh, the, the most similar uh, model to do the transfer learning. Okay, so this is the uh, way we want to do that. So the experiment results are shown here. So the good clustering results with RSA is the same task type clusters in the same group. So you can see this a task similar uh, similarity matrix and this is a task similarity tree. So the second is that this is a task nomi we use in RSA. We can see the different blocks there, the different uh, representations, the similar similarity matrix. We can see we can successfully uh, if you have different uh, uh, different tasks, we can see these two tasks they have high similarities, and these two these tasks with this task don't have too much similarities. We can just uh, compute the task similarities. And the block one, two, three, four, five is that uh, we we calculate different uh, levels, different blocks, different layers for the uh, for example, this is in, in layer one, layer two, or six. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is a task uh, task nomi using small models and the similar similarity ranking of the key point two D task nomi model with small model and the surface normal task task nomi model with small model. So two uh, two D key points task nomi with small is that uh, correlation coefficient and uh, correlation co uh, task DN. So you can see the similarities here and similarity here in two D points with small, and then we have some conclusions. So. Um, but by this is not related to the model search problem, so I will skip this. Okay, uh, so for the transfer learning experiments is what we want to focus on is that we can see we select a task uh, and the data set different from task nomi and obtain the similarity scores of the model trained on a new task with task nomi pre-trained models. And the pre-trained models were ranked according to the similarity score. We then use the pre-trained models for initializing the model and add the last task dependent layers on top of the initialized model to train on the new task. So the concurrent is that it's a good transfer learning performance as task nomi. Well, just like we remember, we need to compare a small model to existing large models and to see which model is the same, similar, uh, most similar, and we select the models to do the model search program to do the transfer learning. Okay, the scalable devil, uh, the last paper today I want to introduce is the scalable devil's model selection for accessible transfer learning. It's published on NIPS 2021. 
Okay, so we have uh, they conduct the benchmark and pro pro propose their own method about this. So the we have uh sixty five sub models on seven target tasks. First, uh, they just uh, uh, make a summary about the existing model such methods such as NCE, leap, H scale, RSA, in, um, Intel logistic, and uh, there is an uh, input at uh, the training time. Is this source task agnostic target task agnostic mean PC and time? So this one, and uh, then they can have a heuristic, uh, heuristic uh, method to do this. And uh, they think that uh, this method are not good enough. So they propose a new idea how to conduct the model search problem. So the first step is they use PCA to reduce the feature vector dimension experiment to show the effectiveness. And the second is the model level depth can help. So oh, what does this mean? So we can see. So if you consider the model depth, uh, it means so this thing is the more depth, the more similar, the, uh, the more good this model is. And the PARC score is another way they want to do this. More formally, given a probe side, the PN of target uh, images X and labels Y and the model parameters. Um, parameterized by theta, PRC produced the two instance matrix D theta dy of shape n times n uh, as this one, this one, and then you can calculate this one. I think you can see this is very similar as RSA, but this one is calculated the difference between um, data size, but the RSA is calculated different between the, the models. Okay. So the experiment results is that the PRC outperforms other results, you can see. Yeah. I will not repeat that. Every paper you'll see this. We found that combined with PRC improved performance on this setting, there are a few limitations on our work. First, they assume that the model selection method is applied to every source model, which could get extremely expensive and subsequent subsequent work should try relaxing this assumption. Okay. So the challenges of this is that uh, paper is go through rank all models will cost a lot of time, which is not practical. And when uploaded, they are said huge. The time cost of the fine or high training is very huge. All existing methods will require go through all the models once, which will result in huge cost. Maybe we can reduce the cost by peeling out some models in advance. So this is the future direction we want to do. How can we just peel out all these models before in advance? Yes. Uh, to reduce the cost of time. And uh, okay, this is my research goal, but I want to do this in the future. So we want to peel out some models before ranking them by the model search strategies to save the computation cost and still keep good search results. And the baseline method is that we can peel out the models with the low test accuracy on their original data set. How to use metrics at model hub? So the first one is we divide the models based on their description of tasks. And second is that we for specific type of model size, for example, the image classification to do a basic, basic transfer learning to train a model set with all models inside contains info or public data set, for example, the image net 1K. Uh, <clears throat> And the third is that we calculate the pairwise diversity for all models if the degree of the agreement exists a specific threshold then we connect the two models with an uh, edge with weight of the diversity. The last one is with this graph, we can do model clustering, model recommendation, model rank, I said. So you can see, for example, we have this new, new graph. So the red line, real line is Real line is an edge between two models. The dash line is the diversity is too high and we don't have an edge between these two models. So when a new model comes in, how to integrate it into the into this graph and calculate the diversity of the cluster before and after the new model has been added, calculate the difference and then put it into cluster which can the lowest accuracy. So this is what we are to do in the future. And then the solution about this is to do the model clustering on the graph. And this will may have a, uh, we have to reduce the search time. We assume that once the graph is built, we can use the clustering results for every search without reconstructing the graph and do the clustering. So the first thing is the step is that uh, first the graph is pre-organized based on, on a transfer of data set, not to upload the data set. Second is find the representative 
tentative model of every cluster compute the performance of the representative model for the upload data data set and select the best model. And the last one is we only need to rank or search the models on the model cluster from the first step. Also, other clustering methods can be tried to save time if we don't use graphs. We can try them later. Another factor is that we don't need to apply all data symbols to fine tune and just need to use part of them if the results can be good. Okay, so this is the uh, last part of this section and uh, the last time part of my PhD teach PhD workshop today. And uh, let's uh, have a summary about what we have today. Okay, here. Okay, so first uh, we have an introduction of model market. We, we, we introduced what is the model market, uh, what are the functions we will, we will have, and what, what we should we do with this model market, what scenarios we will we have is the first one. We have, we show some demos of model market and uh, to show the difference between model market and model hubs. The second is that we do the ensemble learning. Uh, ensemble learning is a very part of a very popular method uh, to combine different models to do collaborative between something like. Uh, and uh, for ensemble learning, we have voting, boosting, bagging, and stacking. And for voting, we introduced the majority voting, plurality voting, and soft voting. And then we introduced the ensemble selection problem. The ensemble selection problem is that you want to select a part of the ensemble teams instead of the select them all. And we can prove that all is best than most. Uh, most is best than all side. And also it will, can, it will have a lot of time cost uh, reduction. And uh, then uh, we have three types of ensemble selection method. One is search-based, the second is rank-based, the last one is cluster-based or diversity-based. And uh, we, we need to show that diversity is really important to do the clustering and uh, it really works. And uh, after that, uh, we need to calculate uh, why diversity is good. So uh, so what is a traditional way to calculate diversity? So we introduced uh, uh, six diversity metrics. Uh, the BB is a uh, kappa, fancy kappa, the uh, Q statistics, uh, all these kind of things. And after we intro finish introduced this uh, different part of kappas, then we introduced the two SOTA papers by Prof. Liu Ling from Gartech about how to do the ensemble selection problems. And uh, we can see some feedbacks and weakness, uh, advantages and weakness of this, this method. And the last part is the model search by data set. Model search by data set is that a user want to upload the data set to the model market and the model market search the models for them to give the models to them. And then they rank them, they can just fine tune their models locally and uh, get the better performance, better than the other models. And then after model search, we have many, many different types of the uh, mass uh, papers we can show here, uh, such as Deborah, Haskonomy, uh, Leap, uh, and uh, NIPS, the network RSA, all kind of introduced the uh, tens of papers to conduct, to, to deal with these problems. And also I proposed my own idea about these models. So I think uh, that's all for this today's PhD teach um, PhD uh, workshop and uh, thank you for attending. So do you have any question now? I will wait for two minutes to uh, 30, 25. Okay. Yeah. Okay, if no, I think we should stop here and uh, thank you very much. <clears throat>